So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research In need of references for your research? Do you want a digital library that you can access for free anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. SERPI is here for you. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SERP, just visit the PIDS website and click the SERP widget or type serp pidsgovph SERP has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. Therapy has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit Therapy now. Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. 
iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan mo ng gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ang kalagahan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag po'y siya'y pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, or PIDS, has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research.
Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We're very glad that you could join us today. This is the PIDS webinar series where we feature our policy studies and the insights of government policymakers and program implementers, industry experts and practitioners, scholars, and civil society actors. With this webinar series, which we started in 2020, we hope to provide an accessible venue for evidence-based discussion of current and emerging development issues. I'm Sheila C.R., and I will be your moderator. Friends, our topic for this week is about our overseas Filipino workers or OFWs. While we cannot emphasize enough the contributions of our OFWs to our economy and society, and it is, it is just proper that they are adequately protected to enable them to leave decent lives overseas and feel safe and secure, especially when unexpected shocks occur. So in this webinar, we will revisit the characteristics of our international migrants and also look at their access to social protection. And by doing so, we hope to identify the current gaps that need to be filled and explore strategies to better serve the needs of our migrant workers. To officially open our virtual event and uh, give us more information about today's topic, I now give the floor to our president at PIDS, Dr. Anisato Arbeta Jr. Thank you, Sheila. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the following. From the government, we have House of Representatives, Congressional Policy and Budget Research Department, Deputy Secretary General Romulo Miral, Jr., and Director Jalina Uliadas. Uh, from the Senate Economic Planning Office, we have Executive Director Merwin Salazar, Department of Labor and Employment Director Arlene Bisnon, uh, Department of Information and Communications Technology Director Philip Barilla, and uh, Technical Education and Skills Development Authority Certification Office Executive Director Maria Susan de la Rama, Banco Central ng Pilipinas uh, Director Verenica Banyagos, uh, and the uh, Commission on uh, Filipino Overseas Acting Director Rodrigo Garcia. We have Department of Foreign Affairs, Assistant Director Bien Janine Alfaro and uh, Charlson Himosora. Ambassador of the Philippines to Brunei Darussalam, Her Excellency Marian Ignacio. From the academy, let me acknowledge the following. Southern Luzon State University Director of International, for International and Alumni Affairs, Juana Paula Berano, and University of San Jose Recoletos Faculty Association Incorporated President Roberto Cabardo. Seliman University Dean Ferdinand Mangibin, uh, Cavite, Cavite State University Dean Evelyn Del Mondo. From the CSOs, NGOs, INGOs, we have Victoria City OFW Federation President Miraluna Casiano, Bacolod OFW Federation President Nympha Toquilio, EB Magalona OFW President Nilio Ortizo, and Villadulid OFW Federation President uh, Beverly Ordinario. Let me greet our friends from the media. Let me also greet our guests, uh, colleagues from government, academe, civil society, media, private sector, and those watching through the PIDS uh, and SERP uh, Facebook pages. Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar. Today's topic 
is on the Filipino migrant workers. Uh, it's relevant uh, because uh, they have heavily been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our overseas Filipinos or OFWs play a significant role in the Philippines' economic growth with their in with international remittances contributing about 9% of the country's gross domestic product. By 2016, the Philippines have been deploying 2 million uh, Filipino workers. According to the uh, Philippine Statistics Authority or PSA, nearly 2.2 million were deployed in 2019 before the pandemic struck. However, in 2020, the deployment was 75% lower than what we annually deploy, with only around 549,000 workers deployed that year. We can attribute this sharp decline to the varying travel restrictions imposed in the Philippines and other host countries to curb the, to curb the virus uh, transmission. The Department of Foreign Affairs reported that over 7, 791,000 Filipinos returned to the Philippines for the same period. The massive repatriation shows how a crisis such as the COVID-19 pandemic threatens the OFW's livelihood and their family's income. Observing the returning OFW poses a challenge to the local Philippine economy, which is also severely impacted by, by the pandemic. The unprecedented impacts of the pandemic on our OFWs and their families have also demonstrated the importance of having an accessible and inclusive social protection system for our migrant workers. To help the government develop effective policies and programs that will help our OFWs get through this challenge, we must look at data first. This afternoon, we will uh, uh, present two studies that uh, look into the characteristics of the international migration and OFW's access to social protection. The first study, uh, analyzing the characteristics of international migration in the Philippines using the 2018 National Migration Survey, was authored by the PIDS Senior Research Fellow Obrita Buga and Research Analyst Ana Rita Vargas and Madeline uh, Luis Baino. It, uh, it, revisited, it revisited the issues of confronting the migrant workers and the Filipino households sending their members to work abroad using the 2018 National Migration Survey. The first representative survey on migration phenomenon uh, conducted by the PSA. Using this study, Dr. Tabuga will provide us with some stylized facts of the Filipino migrants' experience in, ter in terms of motivation, recruitment, and migration process. The second study, analyzing the migration and the, the migrant workers' access to social protection, also authored by Dr. Tabuga, Ms. Vargas, and senior research specialist uh, Blisida Bundes, uh, examined the OFW's access to social protection on site and after they have returned. In this study, Dr. Tabuga will discuss the extent of social insurance coverage among OFWs and their families, the characteristics of those who without social protection and the gaps in accessing social insurance among OFWs. So it will also provide recommendations on improving the access to social protection. We will also hear from the government agencies deeply involved in labor migration and OFWs. We have invited Department of Foreign Affairs, Assistant Secretary for Migrant Affairs, Paul Raymond Cortez, to discuss how the government can foster cooperation with host country governments to ensure the protection of and welfare of Filipino migrant workers. Also joining us, joining us is the uh, Overseas Workers Welfare Administration Director, Dusseline Hapal, who will share their initiatives to provide social protection and welfare services for migrant workers. Finally, we will also hear the perspective of civil society through the Center for Migrant Worker Advocacy uh, Executive Director, Ilin Sana. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and thank you for sharing your insight on this topic. Let me also thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. Your participation during the Often Forum will significantly enrich the discussion this afternoon. I now give back the floor to our moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Dr. Obeta, well, friends, you have heard the um, the uh, our house rules for joining the open forum. So um, just use the chat box located at the lower part of your screen. So I'm referring this is for our WebEx uh, participants, but those who are uh, watching us on uh, Facebook, you're very much welcome to participate in the discussion. So just use the comment section on Facebook, and I will read your questions during the open forum. So friends, at this point, I now invite you to listen to our featured studies for this webinar, which as mentioned by uh, 
Dr. Orbeta are authored, these studies are authored by Dr. Aubrey Tabuga, Ms. Madeleine uh, Baño, Ms. Anarita uh, Vargas, and Ms. Uh, Bless Mondes. And the presentation will be delivered by Dr. Uh, Tabuga, Dr. Aubrey Tabuga, who is a senior research fellow at the PIDS. Um, in her two decade stint at the uh, Institute, she um, has worked on various research topics, including international migration and remittances, poverty, disability, gender, um, health and nutrition, policy analysis, and social networks. And Dr. Tabuga obtained her PhD in public policy from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at National University of Singapore. She finished her master's degree in public policy at the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Tokyo, Japan and obtained her bachelor's degree in economics from the University of the Philippines at Los Baños. Dr. Tabuga, Al, the floor is now yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shar. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, especially to our guest discussants today. I'd like to first acknowledge, of course, uh, my colleagues, um, Anarita Vargas, uh, Madeline Luis uh, Baño, and Bless Mendez for, for the hard work they put uh, uh, in this study with me. So um, this study that we did last year was motivated, uh, of course, as, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Uh, Arbeta, it was motivated by the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic where hundreds of thousands of our migrant workers suddenly came home uh, because their works have been adversely affected. Even those working as professionals uh, or highly skilled workers uh, found themselves suddenly um, negatively affected by, by the pandemic. So the question in my mind then was that given such uh, effects and the magnitude of those adversely affected. My question was, did our OFWs gain access to social protection like, for instance, um, coverage in our public insurance programs uh, or even private insurance schemes? So this uh, which can help them uh, cope you know, in times of crisis like this. So I think it was really important to look uh, into this uh, matter. And also, uh, given that OFWs gain some financial capacity you know, when, when they go to work abroad, I feel that uh, they should take advantage of it and invest in their health and in their future, uh, get themselves a good pension plan. So, and sometimes, you know, overseas uh, work um, has serious or a serious social consequences. I myself um, came from a family of OFWs and um, it can have adverse consequences to families and marriages and to the welfare of children because of long separation. So I really think that the opportunities provided by overseas work must be maximized. So that was the, the rational for looking into social protection. And fortunately, we have uh, a recent national survey that we can use, which is the National Migration Survey. And this was carried out in 2018, uh, which is the pre-pandemic period. And so because of this, we thought that an analysis of the NMS would be useful, uh, also given the, the problems and the difficulties in conducting primary data collection. Next slide, please. Can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you. So I'm, I'm just showing, I want to show you the outline of my presentation. We're just going very briefly to the introduction and then we go to the characteristics of international migration phenomenon and then the migration process and experience and then to access to social protection and recommendations. So you can see I'm presenting actually two uh, papers or two studies uh, in this one uh, 30 minute presentation. Next slide. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, so as mentioned by Dr. Herbert a while ago, we have seen, next slide, please. We have seen the largest magnitude of OFWs who have returned home since the 1970s. Uh, in fact, a total of, uh, as of November 2021, a total of 809,374. And um, in 2020, the FA assisted, uh, based on its website, they assisted 300,200 327,511 OFWs, and this pie chart shows the the breakdown based on their um, destination, where they, they came from. So, of course, Middle East have the largest share in the repatriation uh, because of its being a top destination, and these are the corresponding percentages uh, from other parts of the world. 
In terms of remittances, um, we have seen uh, a performance that is better than expected. Remittances went down by 0.8% in 2020, though the forecasted um, decline, I think, was significantly higher, I think 6% by the BSP, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but in 2021, the performance of remittances uh, was uh, encouraging with a new record high. So it's likely that many of our OFWs who have returned uh, are already going back, you know, as shown by uh, what I've seen in terms of the deployment of, of uh, 600 or 675,000 OFWs from, I think, January to November last year. Nevertheless, um, the pandemic taught us uh, the importance of having access to social protection or social insurance like, like our SSS and uh, other uh, similar schemes. Next slide, please. So the main policy question that we want to examine is simply how to improve migrant workers' access to social protection. So to try to answer this question, we examined, um, of course, access to social protection in terms of, of coverage. But the part of this effort is to analyze the characteristics of the migration phenomenon, you know, to, to gather stylized facts um, about OFW's experience in international migration, uh, since we already have the data and perhaps we can, we can link that to to the access uh, to social protection, and uh, and when uh, and after doing this, after analyzing uh, their characteristics, we can perhaps gain um, uh, uh, insights about gaps and on how to improve um, the social protection access of our migrant workers. Next slide, please. So these are the objectives, as I've mentioned, um, we wanted to analyze the characteristics of migrant workers and their families, their social circumstances and their experience. We want to examine their um, access to social protection, like, uh, like what is uh, available in the data, like SSS or GSIS, field health, um, even on-site protection, uh, such as uh, basic labor-based benefits and uh, health insurance. And the purpose really is to identify areas for improving migrant workers' access to social protection and to draw some policy-related um, insights. Next slide, please. So the data that we use, as I've mentioned, is the National Migration Survey of 2018. Um, this is the country's very first nationwide survey on migration that is really representative of this phenomenon. So it, uh, aside from international migration, there are also uh, rich information on internal migration. And um, it is, uh, as I've mentioned, representative of the population of the migrant sending households uh, in the Philippines. So as, as I just want to clarify again that when I refer to social protection, it's only limited to the data that is available, of course, in the NMS, such as uh, being member or dependent of SSS, uh, GSIS, PhilHealth, uh, other private uh, insurance uh, or, or rather private health insurance uh, programs. Um, and also um, because this does not uh, say anything about maintaining membership, I think for uh, right now, just for the purpose of this study, I think it, it, it also still provides um, useful information. So, ano lang kasi to eh? so membership and coverage, it doesn't say anything about um, like long term maintaining your, your contributions and all that. So, however, I think it's, it still provides a lot of uh, information and insights. Um, there is another caveat in using the National Migration Survey. Um, while the numbers generated by the survey are representative of the migration phenomenon, um, but with respect to the detailed characteristics, uh, for instance, their situation in terms of their of the social protection of the workers' benefits, the information came from returnees because the PSA in the NMS, um, in doing the NMS, interviewed only those who were in the country at the time of the survey. So they did, they did not interview people um, who were then working or residing abroad. I think this is because of um, logistical uh, difficulties of, of doing that. So it's important for us to, to have those in mind as we look into the data that, uh, that will be presented later. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so let me now show you the 
the characteristics of the uh, migration, uh, international migration phenomenon in the country. Six uh, from the survey, six for every 100 Filipinos or 6.4% uh, of those age 15 and above are internet have international migration experience for at least three months. Um, that is, if you translate it into magnitude, that's 4.7 million. As a crude uh, comparison, although they're not really uh, comparable, 3.6% of the global population are considered international migrants in 2020. This is based on, on the UN migration data. So we can say that compared to the global average, we Filipinos have uh, a greater tendency for international migration. Um, the population of, of internal migrants only uh, was at uh, nearly 49% of the population of interest, while some 45% of our population have never migrated, whether internally or, or internationally. And when you say migration, I think the boundary, the minimum boundary here is the city or the municipality. In terms of OFWs, there were 3.58 million OFW members belonging to 3 million households. Next slide, please. As a proportion of the total households, um, those with OFW members comprise 12% of the total. So as this uh, map shows, um, uh, or this map shows the varying tendencies uh, of subnational regions for international migration. So although uh, at the national level, 12% of households have OFWs, other, like if you look at the regional um, disaggregation, um, there is this varying um, tendencies or, or capacities for international migration. So the proportion of households with OFWs um, was, uh, was highest in 2018 in ARM with nearly 24%. So 24%, nearly quarter of their households have OFW members. And this is followed by Cagayan Valley with uh, around 22%, Ilocos region with 18%, and NCR with 17%. This proportion is lowest in Caraga and in Mimaropa. And we also have obtained from the study that um, based on their mother tongue, Ilocanos, like me, have greater tendency for international migration than other groups uh, in the country because the share of population of, of international migrants um, in Ilocos is 16%, but its share in total population is only 9%. Next slide, please. Okay, so without making any attribution to international migration, majority of households with OFWs belong to those in the two highest uh, wealth quintiles. And this is based on their 28 economic uh, situation. So, and households uh, with OFWs have higher percentages of house ownership um, compared to the, the those without house, without OFWs in the household. And uh, so that's, um, they have higher uh, house ownership, 69% uh, versus 57, and they have higher um, proportion of having this asset, all, all these asset types that are shown here in this graph, except I think um, motorized boats, wherein parang pareho lang sila. Next slide, please. Now, let me show you the profile of Filipino international migrants based on their first international movement. So the way that this was um, operationalized, the, the survey by, by PSA is that they obtain information and then they qualify it. Uh, and uh, for this, for the data that is shown here, we are looking at the, for instance, the age of the migrant or mig international migrants uh, when they first engage in international migration. And we found here that regardless of sex, majority of international migrants are in their 20s and an overwhelming majority are in their 20s to 30s. In terms of education, compared to the general population, international migrants are relatively more educated. Let's look at the, the next slide uh, on this further. Next slide, please. Yeah, so, so if you look at the two graphs here, the, the one on the left are for international migrants, um, for um, individuals 15 and above, and the, the one on the right uh, is that for the total population, including the migrants. Okay, so many international migrants um, were composed largely of, of those with at least post-secondary education. So if you add, for instance, those who were graduates of 
post-secondary, those with some college and those who were college graduates um, in their first migration, you, you, can, uh, you can add up and then you can obtain 48%. Uh, but if we if you compare to the like total population, um, the percentage of that uh, of that group is only thirty percent. So international migrants are are more educated than the average uh, Filipino. We can we can maybe say that. Next slide, please. Okay, so. Yeah, if we are after the possible social implications um, to families, um, it's important to note that 47% of the international migrants were married at the time of their first uh, migration. And if we include the married uh, and the married-like status, um, they, they, they comprise 53% and 39% were single. And majority, 63% uh, of, the, of them, of the international migrants, had children. And among those with children, an overwhelming proportion were minors at the time of migration. Next slide, please. In terms of uh, prior work experience, 49% um, of international migrants did not have work prior to movement. And among those who had jobs, then many were in the service and sales um, work, elementary occupations, and, and craft workers. Those are the the double digit um, proportions or share uh, in the table. However, it's interesting to know that majority of them perceived their financial situation prior to movement as sufficient, um, at least. So there were uh, some 44% who noted that their financial capacity was less than sufficient. But mas marami yung sinasabi na um, at least sufficient and then there is some like 3% that they, who said that they that they view their economic uh, capacity as as more than sufficient this is prior to migration next slide please on the top destinations of course the data is consistent with administrative records where the top destinations are the middle east countries so the arabia and the united arab emirates but also we also have significant numbers going to east asia and southeast asia and uh from from this table we from the table on the uh, left the main reason for migration was employment and it's an overwhelming um, evidence that um, they move uh, due to economic reasons, wherein you can see nine, almost 93% reported that they did it for economic purposes, whether it's for a job change or you want to relocate or you want to, to get um, better uh, employment. Next slide, please. Okay, so so we know that most of our first-time migrant workers were young, educated, and driven by economic reasons, though many of them perceived that their economic situation at home was sufficient. Somehow, their occupational profile abroad seems to point out that many were willing to take on jobs that are not commensurate with their educational attainment. So if you look into this table, it shows the distribution of workers with and without higher education. We can see that a large proportion of those with higher education are in elementary occupations and in service and, and sales works. Of course, the proportion of, of such um, elementary uh, occupation workers among those without higher education was, was very high at 47%, but, but that was expected. So perhaps it's, it's important to keep in mind um, the, as we discuss later, you know, the, the access to social protection, that many are young and so maybe their idea of, of pension uh, during the time was very far off. Um, though they are educated, the jobs that many of them get are not commensurate to their educational attainment. Um, so that says a lot about their ability to, to, to pay for their premiums. And so maybe they, they'd rather not, not to be covered by, by insurance uh, programs. But, you know, the, the, the kind of jobs that they get abroad, of course, is also partly due to the types of work that's, that is in demand um, or which are, which are available abroad. So perhaps these factors, you know, contribute to their um, ability or, or inability or lack of willingness to consider uh, social protection access. And um, many of them seem to, to have come from families that are not really, 
you know the poorest of the poor you know based on their pre-migration perception which which is it could which is consistent with with theory um in international migration that because it's costly so it's really not the poorest of the poor who are able to go to go abroad and perhaps uh also the this this finding can you know, help help us in terms of 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 uh understanding or ma making sense uh of of their views on social social insurance and social protection next slide please so let's now go to migration process and um this is very important now we, we include this part because there, of course there is information uh, about it from the survey and so we thought it might be useful to to include it in our, in our analysis and it turned out uh, very useful uh, indeed um let's start with financing next slide please so most international migrants finance their move um, through financial support from family. So nearly 40% um, ang nagagaling sa family nila. And also 25% came from their um, uh, own funds. Um, or 25% of them said that, that it came from their own funds. Which to me says a lot about you know, the strong tendency of people to, to rely on their own families um, in times of need. And the other sources of financing uh, that was shown here um, were the employer and borrowings from family and friends. Um, only a very small percentage took in loans uh, for them to, to finance their migration. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? On the types of visa used uh, by entry. Yeah, so if, if you look at the types of visa used um, um, for entry, oh, sorry, can you go, please? One slide uh, back. Yeah, so if you look at the types of visa used for entry by migrant workers, 78% um, of them used a uh, work visa or work permit. Some 11% used tourist visa um, and others used other types. Um, some 3% I think did not need visa to, to enter the country. And there is some 8% or around 303,000 uh, of them uh, working uh, who change their visa while they're uh, at the destination. So mostly um, when they change their visa, um, they, the visa became a work visa or, or a work permit. Next slide, please. Now we move to the common, uh, to the recruitment mechanism. The most common recruitment mechanism is through private um, recruitment agency. 59% um, followed by uh, direct hiring by employers um, at 34%. So in terms of communication methods in the recruitment process, the dominant method uh, was face-to-face -face, uh, or work uh, walk-ins as shown by 46% by uh, who responded that they used this communication method. Next slide, please. There is a non-negligible proportion um, of of migrant workers, um, that's 12.6% or nearly a half a million, uh, reported that they did not have a written contract prior to entry. And it, if you look at the profile of, of these workers, um, there is a greater tendency of being in this situation for those who had lower educational attainment, those who were directly hired by employers, and those, those who did not need visa, uh, to enter the, the host country and those who went there using tourist visa. These, of course, are, are mere correlations, but nevertheless, I think they are, they are useful in our analysis. Next slide, please. In terms of their assessment of their experience, as I've mentioned in, in, when, I, when I discussed the, the data uh, that we use, the NMS, um, we, the, the NMS or the PSA interviewed uh, uh, basically returnees so they were able to get this information so in terms of their assessment of their experience around 21 percent of households reported that their financial situation improved 73 percent or majority uh, an overwhelming majority of them remained the same they, they felt that their situation remained the same while 6.4 percent um, said that their situation were worse off after migration of course this is this is perception based. 
um, and it's difficult to attribute the changes here uh, to international migration because um, of many other possible reasons. But somehow it helps us understand their situation, especially in the context of, of promoting um, social protection. Next slide, please. Further on their experience, um, half of the returning migrants or like 51% reported that they that they had um, experienced difficulty upon their return. And um, uh, this is mostly pertaining to the difficulty of finding a job uh, and difficulty of finding a job that corresponds to their skills. And an overwhelming proportion also noted that they did not receive any support from the government when they returned and a sizable proportion also were not aware of migration networks organized by the government. And so um, it's really important to have a good discussion like on how to on how to address their needs or perhaps there is a there is a way that we can do in terms of you know uh, raising awareness on the, the, the many programs that the government um, has has prepared them. And so it, it's, it's really important uh, that, that now that we are having this uh, good discussion uh, so that we can help them build on their preparedness and, and how to improve also financial literacy, because basically this is this is about uh, financial literacy. Next slide, please. Now we move to uh, access to social protection. Uh, next slide, please. Many migrant workers um, still lack most of the basic workplace benefits. So let's look at the first country migration data. So the, the way that the PSA um, asked this through the NMS is that they ask whether the respondent um, um, uh, or they ask the respondent if the, 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 these benefits were provided by their by their uh, employers. So the most common benefits received by OFWs in their first migration experience are those um, which um, meet rather immediate on-site needs, such as housing, lodging benefits, uh, and this is followed by food allowance, rice allowance, or other, other consumer uh, product. Majority reported that their employer provided health insurance, so 53%. Uh, either they provide either health insurance or, or medical allowance as part of the benefits. But um, only half provided payment for overtime work. So yung kalahati, wala silang benefits na, na, na nagpipay ng kanila overtime uh, work. 45% provided for compensation for work-related accidents. Um, and only 39% reported they were entitled to paid sick leave. And a smaller percentage provided paid vacation leave. Um, the other benefits that were rarely provided um, included uh, separation pay, maternity and paternity leave, and, and retirement pension. Next slide, please. Okay, so in terms of the, the membership in social insurance, such as SSS, GSIS, and Field Health. So the way that this was asked in the, in the survey was that if uh, at the time of, of the, the first migration, the first country uh, that was uh, visited by, by this worker, whether they have uh, membership or are they dependents in, in this uh, insurance scheme. So SSS, GSIS, Field Health, um, they were also asked, I think, about other uh, private uh, insurance programs. So if we look at the, the proportion of those with access to social security scheme, uh, that is SSS, GSIS, uh, we, we saw an estimate of 49%. While those with um, field health um, coverage, uh, whether being as member or as dependent, um, the estimate was 45% of the total of, of migrant workers. But, you know, the timelines here, vary so we we tried to group the migrant workers based on their first international movement so you can see the the years there the different years because uh, others uh, went in earlier others um nito lang so we categorized them so we have seen that those who engage in overseas work in recent years have um better uh, performance so they have higher proportion there is higher proportion of them with access uh, to the said social protection schemes compared to those um, who were uh, deployed 
earlier. Um, nevertheless, I think there is a lot of room for improvement if we are to maximize the gains from international migration, especially that we found that many households were not necessarily better off after their um, migration experience. Next slide, please. So this table provides a summary of the percentages of those with access to insurance schemes, both public and, and private within the Philippines and on site. So if you look at it, 68% of the migrant workers had access to at least one health insurance, um, while 54% had at least one of these uh, insurance types. And it's important to know the, the characteristics of those without access or those who were non-members or non-dependents to any of these schemes so that we can get uh, we can have an evidence on, on what to target in, in interventions. Next slide, please. So these figures show um, the one on the left on access to the health insurance, um, the one on the right access to social pension. So these figures show the positive correlation between being covered and educational attainment. As you can see, as you as you move the ladder in terms of the education, you can see that uh, there are um, those there are more of those with access to to these uh, programs. So the less educated, they're less likely to be to be covered. Next slide, please. OK, the destinations that have the highest proportion of those without coverage or access to any of the insurance schemes that were included were Malaysia, Bahrain and Lebanon. So you, you get this figure by um, just getting the the number of of migrant workers uh, in Malaysia as, um, that did not have um, this uh, that did not did not have this uh, social insurance they did not they were not covered as a proportion of the the total number of, of migrant workers in that country so that's why we we got this um, these figures. Next slide, please. Now to, to sum up the correlates of not having access to social protection based on the components that we have discovered. So uh, it's more prevalent among women. So these are the characters of those without social protection. It's more prevalent among women. It's, um, it's prevalent among the less educated. Um, and it's more prevalent among those directly hired by employers when you compare it with those that were hired through recruitment agencies. Also, it's more likely among those who did not need visa and those who used tourist visa, visa when compared to those with um, work visa um, upon entry. Also, um, not having social protection is more prevalent among those without written contract than those with written contract. As you can see here, a lucky difference, 53% uh, versus 20%. Next slide, please. It's also more likely among workers um, in private households uh, when compared to uh, those uh, working in private establishments. So 32% uh, compared to 18%. Also, uh, international migrants working in skilled agricultural, forestry, and fishery works um, are less likely to be to be insured. Uh, and second, are those working in elementary occupations? I think if you look at the proportions at Ilumalabas, but if you if you look at the numbers. Um, you, if you consider uh, that we have an, a big number of workers uh, in elementary occupations, you would really say that oh, it's 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 more this group um, that we, we need to protect. Also, um, international migrants belonging to poorer households are less likely to have um, protection, and households living in uh, rural areas are less likely to to have social protection also. Among the top um, destination countries of migrant workers, the following countries have the highest um, percentage of those without social protection. So um, in terms of health insurance, that's Malaysia, Bahrain, Lebanon, South Korea, Kuwait. And then for, uh, for social protection, and that includes health and pension, it's Malaysia, Lebanon, Bahrain, Kuwait, Singapore. It's important not to, to have this information, although hindi naman talaga um, kumbaga formally tested in a formal like regression analysis like that. Um, but purposes of, for instance, of targeting um, uh, targeting uh, beneficiaries or, or saan mo uh, mas intensify yung yung uh, kumbaga promotions or yung programs on increasing awareness um, so, so that's why we have looked into this this um, 
key uh, destinations and we've shown them here so that for instance our outposts in those areas can you know around um device uh, better programs more effective programs for for improving uh, promoting access to social protection so let me just uh, zoom into malaysia for instance uh, to check the profile of workers going there an overwhelming majority of these uh, of the workers in this group meaning those without any social uh, protection uh, based on the components that we have that we have seen um, were they were less educated and they held elementary occupations and this is also the case for singapore in fact for singapore seven in ten of those workers in this situation held elementary occupations so um, perhaps more concrete interventions um, can target you know those going to these countries next slide please so for our recommendations um, we'd, we'd really appreciate um, insights from of course from our colleagues in the government about um, how to, to improve the, the part the recommendations part uh, um, we would we would really um, welcome uh, insights but for now um, I think it's, it's important that we look at um, education, uh, awareness raising um, programs and um, education campaigns. So, uh, based on the first international movement of OFWs, we have seen that Filipino migrant workers were mostly young and educated, um, many with young children, and therefore their priorities uh, may be towards investing in their children rather than investing in their own protection. In fact, there's a literature that, that shows um, OFW investment in their children is their way to prepare for old age. So I think prioritizing you know, awareness, raising and, educa and education of our current and prospective migrants workers, migrant workers on the importance of social protection and being covered by our public insurance systems is, is an important step. You know, in investing in their protection also benefits their children and their families indirectly, you know, because this will lessen um, uh, the uh, you know um, for lack of better term burden you know on their, their, on their children in the in the future also um there is a great and urgent need to improve on financial literacy you know to increase the willingness and commitment of migrant workers to regularly contribute to insurance schemes for their protections and uh, invest in their health to save more perhaps and invest in things that can help them mitigate the effects of of the of crisis whatever whatever uh will be the crisis in the future. For various efforts of expanding social protection access, the groups that must be prioritized are the less educated migrant workers, the women, those who hold elementary occupations, as these groups are less likely to have access to social protection. Next slide, please. Apart from education campaigns, um, there is a great need to intensify our promotion in terms of memberships in various insurance schemes and other social protection components. For this, I think we we need to um, work hard work harder in terms of simplifying our processes like like enrollment and payment. Um, I have uh, a, a person here with with first hand information. So my husband is a, is a former OFW and um, um, one of his uh, one of his constraints, of of course, also is the this this enrollment and this payment um, uh, while while he was uh, working abroad. So I think. Um, this is also the the issue uh, for, for for some people still, despite the the advancement that we've had in in the internet uh, and in payment systems. Uh, also, there is a need uh, perhaps to conduct assessment of the current mechanisms being utilized in securing the overseas employment certificate with respect to its um, ability or maybe inability to promote access to social insurance. No, so. These online platforms for OAC processing may have resulted to a more efficient process of securing the document, um, and that, that's really very helpful. But I think it may have um, reduced the opportunity for enrolling, you know, FWs in, in social protection schemes. Because di mo na kailangan dumaan dun sa sa na kailangan mong mag maging SSS, mag magkaroon ng SSS or feel health. Um, so I, I think we should look into this and see how we can. Turn, turn, turn things around. And apart from the groups that we can target that I have um, mentioned earlier, uh, as I've said, our outposts in destinations with the highest percentage of those without social protection can perhaps include in their programs, you know, the promotion of, of social protection. So we mentioned Malaysia, Lebanon, Bahrain, Kuwait, Singapore, I think to, to some extent Hong Kong then. Um, since um, 
And also since we've seen that those who use tourist visa and those who did not need visa in their entry, like um, those moving around Southeast Asia, kasi hindi natin kailangan ng, <laughs> ng visa, um, they are more likely to, ha to not have social protection also. And, and the destinations where, yeah, where this is prevalent, as I've mentioned, are yeah, the, the Malaysia again. So, at the yung hindi kailangan kasi ng visa eh. And people go there uh, using tourist visa. So, United Arab Emirates, actually, ang laki ng, ng percentages. Again, Malaysia, Singapore, and Hong Kong. So, efforts for promoting social protection in this, these host economies must be developed, um, if not intensified further, if there are already um, existing programs. So I think this, these are the initial recommendations that we have so far and we look forward to, to the insights from our colleagues and of course from our from the public um, through the Q&A. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to uh, Dr. Aubrey Tabuga for your clear and uh, comprehensive presentation. So friends, um, at this point, let's continue the conversation and this time we will hear, we will give the floor to three officials uh, whom we invited to give their uh, comments and insights on the presentation. And we will hear first from the Overseas Wel uh, Workers Welfare Administration, or OWA, an attached agency of the Department of Labor and Employment vested with the function of developing and implementing um, welfare programs and services for OFWs and their families. And we are privileged to have with us uh, this afternoon, Director Jocelyn Hapal, who heads OWA's Policy and Program Formulation and Review under the directive of the OWA Board of Trustees and OWA Administrator Hans uh, Leo Kakda. She previously headed the Repatriation Division and the Overseas and Regional Operations Coordinating Services, and she has been assigned as Welfare Officer and Attaché in the Philippine Embassy in Athens and the Philippine Consulate General in Milan. Director Hapal holds a master's degree in industrial relations from, uh, the, from uh, UP Diliman under the sponsorship of the Civil Service Local Scholarship Program. She has more than 30 years of government service. Director Hapal, ma'am, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Ms. Sheila, for the nice introduction. Am I coming in clear? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, so first I'd, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of our civil society organizations. Uh, I, I'm seeing here, Ma'am Ellen, and uh, our overseas, uh, our OFW family circles are also here, and of course our colleagues in the government. So at the outset, uh, let me thank the PIDS uh, through its esteemed president, and Dr. Aniceto Urbeto Jr. for yet another relevant study and timely, if I may say, related to the international migrants and of course for this opportunity to discuss the analysis that we found to be important in our sphere of mandate to OFWs and their families. So uh, my congratulations as well to the PIDS uh, research team, Dr. Aubrey Tagbuga, thank you. And uh, Ms. Ana Rita Vargas and Ms. Maria Belesila Mondes for successfully delving into this very important subject uh, in migration phenomenon. So overall, we find the study unique in the sense that it uses the first ever 2018-19 National Migration Survey, <laughs> allowing a more reflective representation on the findings and stylized facts on IM's access to social protection. So, and uh, we find the uh, analysis and the recommendations to be clear cut and straightforward and uh, pointing to practical and doable measures that government agencies like OWA can, uh, can uh, seriously consider, of course. But uh, let me give some of our uh, key takeaways on this analysis and based also on my, our reflections now that we are in two years of the pandemic, there's a lot of lessons learned there. So number one, uh, we see that the study confirmed the a priori notions on migrants' access to social protection. So for one, the study says that uh, the common benefits received by OFWs in their first migration experience are those which meet rather immediate on-site needs rather than uh, uh, considering safety nets or social uh, insurance uh, but of course for especially for the first time migrants employers provide for basic needs of housing lodging food allowances and so on 
this follows the basic pr uh, provisions of the standard employment contract anyway. So progression in, in stay and work allows the worker to negotiate for more benefits and of course access to the host countries my mandated social benefits of let's say health insurance, medical allowance, paid leave, bonuses and of course the much desired gratuity and end service benefits and in some countries the retirement pension. Okay, so uh, we also, it also confirms that income is positively correlated with access to health and social insurance, and it follows the stay and work progr progression that I uh, mentioned earlier, and of course the nature of occupation in relation to the salary. And uh, we also, um, we also, uh, the study also confirms that the nature that, the, that in terms of nature of work, there is much difference between being a permanent worker and a seasonal worker. So both have a seemingly low level of access to health uh, insurance, uh, to health and social insurance. So in the final analysis, the results posited that there is much to be done to ensure coverage of OFWs in social insurance. I cannot help but agree. <laughs> but of course, this is a, stud, a, stu, a study. Uh, but the thing is, this is despite the compulsory private insurance coverage of agency hired workers under the amended Migrant Workers Act, which was issued in 2010. Okay, and of course, on OWA membership, that nearly half or 49% of the working migrants are non OWA members in their first migration. But this coincides with the fact that OWA Act happens in 2016 when uh, membership enrollment through contract processing in POEA is mandated under the law. Okay, so it's far from the 1977 when OWA was still a welfare and training fund. Okay, so uh, my second takeaway is that um, the pandemic actually opened vulnerabilities posed by inadequate social protection. Okay, um, and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic to us is like a Pandora's box. Okay, and uh, this proves that the pandemic, uh, regardless of a nation's status on economic, social, political, a pandemic like the COVID-19 encompasses all. And because we have more than 10 million Filipinos across the world, uh, the, ma the massive displacement is but natural. Okay, so, but uh, can we have the... Next slide, please. I'd like to show you, I'd like to show you the magnitude uh, of the return on um, two years now into the pandemic. So in our database is 1.2 million, but these are all records of those who returned. Okay, by, by gender, uh, a little over is the male uh, uh, number than the female. And I'd like to point that um, many of those in the top rank are household, uh, household workers, which are considered vulnerable. And you can see that nurses and the seafarers were the first to be affected in the, uh, uh, the pandemic. Next slide, please. Okay, and in terms of jobs, that's the return coming from Saudi Arabia. Of course, we have 1.2 million uh, Filipinos in Saudi. And uh, here it is, UAE with um, 165,000. Uh, as Dr. Tabuga po uh, pointed out in the, in the studies that uh, many of those without access to social protections are usually those that do, do not require visa. So, isa po ang United UAE. Okay, and in terms of where they are coming home to, uh, pinakamalaki dyan yung uh, Region 4A, alright? Uh, region 3 and CR, Region 6, Region uh, 7. Okay, so uh, actually, I'd just like to uh, tell you the profiles of the returnees. But what uh, I would like to uh, tell you is that actually is how vulnerable this uh, returnees have been. Okay, for instance, 
even the most basic contract provisions were thrown out of the windows. Many of our topmost claims of domestic workers, skilled workers, and fisher folks were about salaries and end service benefits. Maraming na iwan uh, with the pandemic. So it was brought forth to the conciliated conciliation table not longer at our Polo OWA, but already here in OWA head office because of the need to be repatriated as soon as possible. So here we we are having difficulty in conducting conciliation to claim, to, to bring them their claims and uh, justice. But uh, then again, we are here under stringent community protocols. So there's a, also a lack of medical treatment and facility for those uh, OFWs infected with COVID and forced them to cramp in work accommodations on site. And they suffered physically and mentally. There were deprivation of food, hygiene, and medical supplies. And it happened in the most stringent community quarantines at the workplace overseas. Well, the travel bans and restrictions left OFWs with long-term extended stays, not in the employer's accommodation, but the, in the embassy and Polo OWA sponsored shelters. You know, even the seafarers with the most access to social protection benefits, they have to be extended return assistance um, to ensure that they are repatriated to the point of destination. And, and even the fishers uh, suffered extreme isolation, food and water supply deprivation, and untreated medical conditions, uh, being at sea and stranded for months, while allotments were withheld from their families. Okay? And uh, without unemployment assistance or benefit, most OFWs now find themselves in dire situation of no income, and bleak prospect of gainful employment upon return to the country. So, you know, even the mandatory insurance coverage of the, as mandated under the law, these were, I think, thrown out of the windows because service providers says that force majeure and, um, pardon me, ACOF's God are not covered by the mandatory insurance. All right. So, uh, even OWA membership, protection under OWA membership, Oh, wow, we uh, first saw our first ever uh, massive fallout <laughs> of, of, of membership with a sharp 69% decrease in membership uh, since 2020. This is because of the exodus of the returnees and the suspension of deployment of new hires and rehires. So uh, that brings me to the, my third uh, takeaway. We, we, I say, if I may say that, you know, despite the level of access to social protection when on site and regardless of the status of working migrants in host countries, I'd say that the Philippine government through the whole of government approach, uh, our esteemed DFA is here with us. We can say that the Philippine government enabled a safe safety net for returning affected and displaced Filipino workers amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. On the part of OWA alone, if, if I can bring you to the next slide. Yes. OWA, uh, as of March 31, since we started two years ago, uh, we have caused the return of OFWs to their families safe, uh, safely, now numbering 983,858. We're almost breaching 1 million. Uh, we directly assisted the return. Uh, this, this OFWs, either land-based or sea-based, whether documented or undocumented, whether OWA member or not, where, uh, regardless of the field health uh, coverage, we have caused the return uh, safely of these OFWs. These repatriations are through chartered land, air, and sea travel means. And of this number, and closely 976,334 OFWs were provided with hotel quarantine facilities with pool board meals in mandated 5, 10, or even 14 days of quarantine. Medical treatment and special attention, particularly women OFWs, were daily were given daily provisions by emergency hired house parents 
and roving nurses and midwives. And uh, by the way, COVID man, uh, vaccines were covered by PhilHealth and conducted by the Philippine Red uh, Cross and the Medical Corps of PCG and uh, the AFP. Next slide, please. Okay, this is just to show you how 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 the quarantine operation uh, operation um, were implemented right from the start and the chartered flight. Of course, with the help of our DFA uh, missions, Philippine missions, uh, we extended mass repatriation, uh, airport assistance to transfer to hotel, from hotel stay to 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 their medical uh, needs. Even uh, babies, we have more than two hundred in quarantine facilities. Uh, we and until the repatriation is straight to their homes, almost door to door. Uh, with the help, of course, of our LGU. These are all under the mandate of the IATF. All right. Next, please. Next, yes. Just to show you the breadth and the scope of the operation and the kind of assistance we have provided to OFWs and their families, this regardless of their status. Okay. It, it starts with the host country. We hand the welfare cases, usually those are just in distress condition, those who need their unpaid salaries, they earn service benefits. Uh, we have provided food packs, hygiene kits under the most stringent uh, quarantine um, protocols in the countries. And then we have also Alaga Kabayan to provide uh, 200 cas assistance for those infected uh, with the with the virus, and of course, um, post repatriation, we extended livelihood. We now focusing on reintegration, uh, um, making making sure that we have available uh, pathways mm -hmm. on on local employment, on reskilling together with TESDA, uh, 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 and livelihood and business opportunities, on educational assistance. Um, uh, we consciously uh, doubled the number of our uh, educational aid scholarship, uh, considering that there are many fallouts from the school during the pandemic. And, uh, and of course, to support the OFW have, who have been, you know, suddenly without income. Okay. And in terms of welfare, kahit po tayo pandemic, may calamity pa rin. So we reach out to the families. We provided medical assistance as well. Yung mga nag-COVID pa rin here. Um, we even uh, caused the repatriation, of course, together with DFA. Yung pong uh, cremation ng ating mga OFWs, 80% uh, were afflicted. The cause of death is uh, covid and of course, uh, mga, ang ating mga cash assistance on, uh, on those in Saudi Arabia and, and the famous Dole Akap. <laughs> All right. So, um, you know, in quarantine, uh, in quarantine operations alone, we have already spent to 30 billion. Okay. Of this 30 billion, uh, 28 billion are f is from the GAA. That's the government assisting, providing the safety net, regardless of the social the absence or the ne, uh, low level of access to social protection to OFWs. Okay, if if the, if the cost of this whole thing will be charged to OWA, then we can go bankrupt. <laughs> 2021 pa lang. So it's really good that the, the government is uh, financing the whole operations. Okay, so let me go to the, um, the last takeaway, if I have uh, several minutes. Uh, we Now, uh, the lessons here is that uh, social protection is indeed a springboard for a more inclusive welfare mechanism. And if I might say for a sustainable and long-term reintegration. Okay, I think the OFW, OFWs now are at the crossroads, whether they go to the path again of overseas work mm -hmm. or to remain and find work locally. But mm -hmm. you see, either way, he or she might find bleak prospects, given that the continuing threat, a threat and impact of the pandemic in the country and elsewhere. Uh, so, so 
if one choose to return overseas, there's a need for greater access to social protection, right? Uh, and it's even more pronounced post-pandemic and in whatever status once the entry would be. Okay. And in OWAS four decades of experience, and as the research analysis suggests, the way for an inclusive welfare mechanism for, my, for migrant workers goes beyond the immediate economic gain, but more so in the extent and breadth of social protection accorded to them. Okay, so um, should one choose to remain and find means locally, then greater access to social protection is also a basic necessity to ensure that reintegration efforts produce a long-term and sustainable assimilation in the country's socioeconomic mainstream. Okay, so as a final point, OWA in essence, essence subscribes to the recommendations of the study and uh, to take uh, seriously all the nitty-gritty details of the recommendation. One, we participate and support the pursuit for legally binding BLAs, Bilateral mm -hmm. Labor yes. Agreement, and MOA uh, with destination countries with particular interest in social protection provision. Kasi dati po ang mga bilats only on, you know, standard contract, etc. Et but now consciously more on social protection. And of course, against ads, we push for, for to forward dialogues for portability of social security contributions such that pag may pandemic naman, wag naman po sana magamit naman po ng ating mga kababayan. Okay, number two, increase access to OWA memberships. Like, yes, we can relax requirement. We have digital platforms now like the OWA mobile app. But then we have to take in consideration, sabi nga po ni Ma'am Ellen sana, uh, that uh, that there are those who are all still limited rich in technology. Hindi pa naman po lahat. And uh, so shout out sa aming mga OFW family circles here and the OFW help desk. Natulungan po kami in this area. And of course, yung bilin nyo to target areas in countries with low access to OWA. Yes, we will revisit uh, the, our financial literacy program to target the less educated workers, those in elementary occupations, and generally those vulnerable workers. Okay, we will look at the characteristics of the IMs in terms of the access, and uh, of course we can we need to increase awareness programs in social protection, starting perhaps with our PDOS. Okay, so yun po. And, and then, of course, we have to revisit as well our partnership with POEA to look into the OEC issuance to capture Balik Manggagawa and the rehires kasi sila yung halos hindi nakakapag-renew ng kanilang uh, feel health, pag-ibig and OWA. And uh, uh, considering that on-site, yung nangyayari sa POEA dito sa head office, hindi nga nangyayari kadalasan sa on-site. So, tama po. While well, it facilitates uh, faster, efficient OEC issuance, pero na-left out po yung social protection. Lastly, uh, of course, ito po, as pointed out earlier, we support the National Reintegration Program under the National in uh, Economic Recovery Strategy. We hope that this can be enhanced by the new newly created Department of Migrant Workers. We look to test the for the hours upskilling and reskilling for livelihood startup and enhancement and of course to increase awareness on the on the benefits of social protection that can be accessed for the benefit of the OFWs and their families so with that maraming salamat po magandang hapon at maraming salamat din po uh, director Joseline Hapal of uh, OWA so we will hear more from uh, director Hapal during the open forum Thank you very much, ma'am, for your insightful uh, takeaways as well as uh, giving us uh, um, some details about the COVID-19 response of OWA for our uh, migrant uh, workers um, while they are overseas during the repatriation uh, process and also uh, at the post-repatriation uh, stage. Okay, so friends, um, another government agency that is at the forefront of um, 
um, assisting and uh, promoting the welfare of our OF, of our migrant workers is the DFA. And we are uh, very pleased to have with us today Assistant uh, Secretary Paul Raymond Cortez, um, a diplomat and public uh, servant for more than 25 years. ASEC uh, Cortez currently heads the Office of the Migrant Workers Affairs, or OMWA, of, uh, which is under uh, DFA. And he has been leading the mass repatriation of overseas Filipinos affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as um, Philipp in general Filipinos in distress. Prior to his assignment at OMWA, he was the third secretary and vice consul of the Philippine Embassy in Budapest, consul then deputy consul general at the Philippine Consulate General in Honolulu, and Consul General in Dubai. He was conferred in 2018 the Presidential Award Dakilang Kamano or Grand Cross for Exemplary Diplomatic Service and had received other awards such as the DFA Best Organization Award, Best Assistance to National Units, to Nationals Unit, and uh, DFA Best Performing Unit Award. And I'll give you Asik Paul Cortez of DFA's Office of uh, Migrant Workers Affairs. Sir, the floor is now yours. Marami salama. Thank you very much, Dr. Sheila. And uh, first and foremost, uh, wonderful to see everybody here, all 146 of us listening and uh, hoping to validate this, the results of the study of Dr. Tabuga and uh, everyone else. And of course, let me congratulate the efforts of uh, the authors of our uh, studies, Dr. Tabuga, uh, research analyst Vargas, uh, Ms. Blasila Mondes, and uh, research analyst Madeline uh, Baeno. I mean, your studies on uh, relevant migration issues represent a significant contribution towards the formulation and improvement of our current policies aimed at safeguarding the welfare of our Kababayan OFWs. Personally, I've always felt that uh, public policy, or in the case of the DFA foreign policy, of which the promotion and the protection of the welfare and rights of overseas Filipinos is a top priority, must be grounded in concrete academic data. Policy cannot be plucked out of thin air or be born out of an ivory tower detached from ground realities. And data backed by scientific study and founded on the scientific procedures and methods for which uh, these two studies I am reacting to today must eventually feed into the policy formulation, implementation, and execution processes of our government. This, I believe, is the heart and soul of public policy management, and this is exactly what we should uh, give our Kababayans as well. Now, in my personal experience and uh, regular interaction with the Filipino communities abroad, uh, most recently in Dubai, which hosts a, uh, you know, one of perhaps one of the fastest growing and most vibrant overseas Filipino communities in the world, and in Hawaii, where over 80% uh, of the overseas Filipino there are uh, Ilocanos, uh, like me, and Dr. Tabuga. I find that both of the studies accurately reflect the situation when it comes to the foreign employment uh, circumstances and conditions of our overseas Filipinos. Now, uh, their, temporal employ uh, their employment is usually temporal and tentative in nature, and of course, it does not provide a long-term financial security plan or blanket for these OF, uh, overseas Filipinos. Yet, despite uh, the short-term uh, capacity enhancement, for our Kababayans and the limited access to social and labor protections abroad, many of our Kababayans still choose to risk working abroad primarily due to uh, immediate financial necessity. Now, this is uh, primarily founded on the core Filipino value of being very close, uh, having very close family uh, ties or family orientation, compelling them to find employment abroad not only for their nuclear family or for their uh, wife or, or children, but also for their extended family members. And this would be parents, uh, other brothers and sisters, grandparents, cousins, niece, neighbors, and all of them dependent on the overseas Filipinos uh, financial standing. Now in this scenario, our OFWs usually find themselves uh, stuck in that cyclical pattern of abuse and subsistence. And I agree with the conclusion of the study that migration becomes an effective avenue to improve a family's financial situation, but only for the short term. 
not long term. And what is crucial then would be the presence of shock absorbers if and when return is inevitable, return to home country. And dito na nga yung mga reintegration programs natin. Um, another point that had been made in the study was that uh, there needs to be a greater awareness and a stronger effort at educating our people on the on-site provisions regarding their work. And this would include the uh, end of service benefits, uh, insurance, and of course, our own uh, local social protection schemes, SSS, PhilHealth, etc. <clears throat> now, given that many of our Kababayans leave the country as tourists for places like uh, the UAE, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, and Lebanon, and, and many others, there obviously needs to be a stricter implementation at our ports of exit. And this means a more stringent Bureau of Immigration uh, check for departing passengers. And when we mean uh, educating, however, our people, we don't just mean uh, working on, on, on their work conditions, but also including them, including educating them on finances. And this is where financial literacy comes in. And uh, perhaps even onto entrepreneurship and innovation as a way for preparing them for not only you know going up the ladder where they are abroad, but also for event uh, for eventual reintegration if they return to the Philippines. Now, uh, one particular point that may be glossed over by many is the um, the study's acknowledgement that there are equally important aspects that require a deeper digging if the results of this study are to be accepted as scientifically tight and sound and uh, less prone to uh, fallibility or holes that uh, none of the surveys used uh, to analyze the characteristics of our international migration phenomenon had ever achieved an adequate sample as said in the study to represent national level migration uh, statistics shows how much more we need to be even more scrupulous or even more detailed when it comes to gathering data and information for the purpose of coming up with appropriate sound, mig uh, and sound migration policies. Now, I have a skewed preference uh, to numbers and statistical probabilities due to my background as a math major, and thus I cannot stress uh, enough uh, how important I, I think uh, the scientific method of data gathering is an analysis in crafting and drafting appropriate uh, policies for the benefit of our people. Perhaps uh, not only the foreign Philippine Foreign Service posts abroad uh, through the embassies and through the consulates, but also through our uh, labor offices abroad and others uh, could be could play a role in this, especially as we try to. Um, understand also for ourselves and not just as far as the PIDs would be concerned, what it means to gather data, study them, and recommend appropriate policy. Now, all these taken, uh, taken into account, the DFA, in coordination with the other relevant agencies, has continuously evolved uh, its policies to better assist and provide uh, appropriate repatriation and reintegration assistance for our OFW. Sinabi na nga kanina, yung mga... Uh, policies that we've had for those who returned during the pandemic at andyan na yung not only giving them free tickets to come back home but uh, helping them uh, you know with the uh, quarantine process and dyan po ang OWA and of course yung pag-uwi na sa kanilang mga probinsya and this is where uh, Oplan Kalinga and uh, Balik Probinsya would, would come in. Now these policies were aimed at uh, safeguarding our uh, overseas Pinoys uh, against the negative effects of migration and uh, the pandemic. Uh, and speaking of pandemic, uh, the DFA and all the government agencies has never wavered in, in our commitment to bring home distressed overseas Filipinos. As of um, last April 1st, we have already uh, brought home about 459,000 through the ATN funds of the DFA since the beginning of the pandemic in March 2020. Almost 80% of these are land-based workers. So ito yung mga galing uh, mga kababayan natin from the Middle East and, and uh, East Asia. Uh, we've also organized uh, over 100 repatriation flights bringing home about 30,000, 40,000 overseas Pinoys in addition to the endorsement of the DFA for what we call special commercial repatriation flights or bayanihan flights, mga 40,000 naman po ang nakauwi noon. And uh, through the ATN fund and the legal assistance fund, which the DFA uh, manages, 
we have continuously furnished other forms of assistance as well to our distressed overseas, overseas Filipinos dun naman when they are abroad. Uh, welfare assistance, rescue assistance, shipment of remains, o kaya yung mga cremated remains nila, yung mga personal belongings, hospitalization, medical assistance, and of course, uh, legal assistance and representation kung kinakailangan nila. Through our social media engagements and partnerships also uh, with other government agencies like uh, Polo, uh, Dole, uh, iLab, and uh, OWA, the DFA has uh, worked to raise awareness of these important safeguards as uh, mentioned a while back by uh, our authors, including and most especially the need to follow proper legal procedures laid down by the POEA, because this would then be uh, their precursor to be able to apply and enroll for uh, PhilHealth, for OWA membership, and all these uh, social uh, protection measures that we have in place for our overseas Filipinos. Um, may I also cite a minor note, uh, a minor note uh, referred to in the NMS, wherein it stated that the proportion of OFWs who received assistance from either the embassy or the consulate has declined in the past five years. I mean, obviously, the number of uh, uh, OFs requiring ATN services may have lessened and I think this is a, uh, we could construe this as a welcome development because maybe the conditions of uh, overseas Filipinos are uh, abroad are much better and it reflects well yung mga promotion natin on how we can make their lives easier abroad and at the same time show what the government can and cannot do for them. Now, um, this is this is in line with the DFA, with the government's role of uh, promoting safe and regular migration. And this is very important because we can assure the public that itong uh, pr priority natin of uh, promotion, uh, promoting their rights is certainly still within the uh, uh, radar, not only of the DFA, but of all the Philippine government agencies uh, abroad. Now, um, another note highlighted was the effort to establish multiple bilateral relations agreements with certain countries and uh, we have demonstrated our commitment for migrant uh, protection through the participation in the consultation and implementation of what we call gcm or the global compact for safe orderly and regular migration now uh, the gcm is the first intergovernmentally negotiated uh, non-binding instrument that serves as a comprehensive framework uh, approach to international migration and the Philippines as a champion country uh, raises awareness for these basic migrant rights and protection. Now, um, itong 23 GCM objectives uh, were highlighted in another milestone uh, in Republic Act 11641, uh, which is the law creating uh, the Department of Migrant Workers, making the Philippines the first and only country so far to include in our domestic legislation a progressive realization of the 23 objectives of the GCM. This means that the uh, GCM now becomes a part of our legal uh, environment when it comes to migration, in addition to our uh, RA 8042, uh, as amended by RA 10100, uh, uh, pursuing fair and ethical recruitment, work, uh, my mobility, and uh, human rights for all our uh, overseas Filipinos. Now, this achievement was uh, submitted to the UN uh, Network Hub and um, realized uh, na ito yang, the Philippines is a model country as far as making uh our uh what we call this our principles on migration become a reality and uh, of course as an end we'd like to thank uh, dr tabuga uh, and everyone else all the others uh for for studies like this as they help government especially the dfa in coming up with appropriate policies sa mga kababayans natin it cannot be emphasized enough how how much we need uh, studies like this to make our uh, policies worthwhile and beneficial and relevant to the overseas Filipino. Marami salamat po. And thank you very much, um, ASEC Paul Raymond Cortez of the DFA. Um, thank you, sir, for your insightful uh, remarks and also for um, giving us um, uh, details about uh, what the DFA is doing to help our uh, distressed uh, migrant workers and, uh, you know, also assisting their families. So maraming salamat, uh, um, ASEC Cortez. We will hear more from... Um, our official from the DFA uh, during the open forum. Okay, so friends, um, 
Okay, so we, we now come to our final uh, reactor, and this time we will hear the voice of our civil society through the Center for Migrant Advocacy. Um, the Center for Migrant Advocacy is an NGO that works for the rights and welfare of Filipino migrant workers and their families through policy advocacy, facilitating assistance to distressed migrants and capacity building for migrant organizations, local governments, and other relevant stakeholders in the country and overseas. And the Center for Migrant Advocacy is also a new member of the Stakeholders Chamber on the Sustainable Development Goals. Please help me in welcoming to our webinar its Executive Director, Ms. Okay, Ms. Um, uh, Director Ellen, Ellen A. Sana. So friends, let us all welcome Director Aileen, uh, Executive Director Aileen A. Sana from the Center for Migrant Advocacy. Ma'am, the floor is now yours. Sorry, Cha. Cha from uh, the OWA. Uh, audible po ba ako? <laughs> yes, ma'am. We can hear you well okay. po. You may proceed. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So uh, let me proceed to the next slide, please. And of course, uh, thank you very much to BIDS and congratulations. I think I shared the statements of uh, the DFA and the OM and the OWA in appreciating the study and especially bringing back to the table the importance of the National Migrant uh, Survey. Sometimes I get confused because we also use NMS for National Migrant Sunday. <laughs> so it's National Migrant Survey, very important because we always, as uh, as Cortez mentioned, we need to have evidence to be able to guide our policies. You know, we have to have uh, informed uh, policies and we can only do that if we have the, the data, no? So, yun pong pagsakto ay di syempre something on social protection, but just to start off by saying and asserting that social security is a basic human right, now if you're looking at the, the person, and at the same time, this is also confirmed by the International Labor Organization as one of the pillars for decent work. So, decent work, uh, may apat po yan uh, elemento, and uh, one of that is the access to social uh, protection. Next slide, please. Uh, may I request for the next slide? Ako ba naglalag? Okay. Yeah, so it's a basic human right, but then, uh, of course, uh, it has to find expression in terms of laws and policies uh, in the countries in the Philippines, but also when the worker crosses the border. And it's not automatic that this is present. So particularly for the countries of destination, you observe a lot of uh, exclusion in terms of the policies to access social protection or to uh, grant social protection to migrant workers. Not like that uh, everybody is excluded, pero malaki po yung proportion ng low-wage migrant workers natin, specifically our women migrant workers, uh, in low-wage occupation and in the so-called low-skilled occupation, such as domestic work, na sila po ay excluded from this uh, protection of the labor and social laws. And of course, as also mentioned by uh, the research, lalo din kasama dito yung kawalan ng social protection for the undocumented migrants. And this is also similar to uh, Director Joe's statement, ay nagkaroon din po kami ng study on social protection for migrant workers way back in 2012. So, ganito rin po yung aming uh, ilan sa mga findings, no? Okay. The other issue is, uh, of course, this is also specifically true for our migrant workers in Asia, where more than 80% go to, uh, particularly in the Gulf states, Southeast Asia and East Asia. At saka din po, as uh, mentioned as well by Director Joe, the social protection programs uh, available or made available to migrant workers generally responds to the immediate and temporary protection. So, yan yung mga kasama talaga yan sa uh, ating standard employment contract, accommodation, food, etc. But then, very much wanting in terms of the medium and long-term benefits. 
And especially this is very urgent in the context that uh, we are going to have our 50th year of overseas employment, uh, 2024. And we've had like probably two, three generations already of our OFWs. At mahalagang pag-usapan yung kanilang mga pag, pag nag-forgood na sila at nagkaroon na po ng, uh, ng nag-return sila kasi matanda na sila. Of course, the other observation is the fact na meron pong shifting from state uh, provision of the social protection to private uh, service providers. So, kinukuha ng mga insurance uh, uh, enrollment, in enroll sa insurance uh, companies, yung ating mga yung provisions for social protection. No? So, yun din ang trend not only in the Philippines but also in the countries of destination. Second slide, next slide please. Uh, yeah, and of course, especially in the context of pandemic, ito po ay naka, napakalaking challenge talaga. So, social protection and safety nets. Again, we heard a lot of uh, the lamentation of our migrants, both on-site and for those who have returned. Specifically, mga pamilya rin po ng ating mga OFWs ay nagsasabi na, oh, hindi kami nakakasama sa mga ayuda. Ay, wala rin naman silang safety nets. But more so, when they are stranded uh, on-site sa mga bansang pinagtatrabahuhan nila, uh, there was mention of Malaysia, for example, at marami po tayong stranded and they've been saying that uh, they were excluded from provisions of ayuda, for example, uh, extended by the Malaysian government. So in this uh, slide, I, it gives you an overview of uh, the situation of migrant workers globally, and uh, particularly dito sa ASEAN region, I 43% lamang po ang, ang nakareceive ng social protection. So you have a very significant uh, percentage na walang uh, social protection or state-funded uh, relief especially in these times of the pandemic. So very urgent yung concern na wala silang mga pagluluaran as we say in Tagalog na pag dito sa mga uneventual or uh, sa mga unexpected na, na events brought about by the pandemic. Next slide please. Okay, so what did we do in response to the situation? And not only in the time of COVID, we've heard already from the OWA and also from the DFA, but just to reiterate, na meron tayong uh, welfare fund from the OWA, meron tayong enrollment sa PhilHealth, uh, Pag-IBIG, and SSS. And these are all mandatory now under the laws. And uh, the thing is, OFW pays all of the contributions in the social uh, security programs. There is also the Employees' Compensation Commission program, but currently this is only availed of by the sea-based workers. And of course, uh, by uh, virtue of uh, the law on migrant workers cemented under RE10022, there is also the compulsory insurance coverage for all agency hired uh, migrant workers. So ito pong sila ay nagsisibing mga programa for social protection for our migrant workers, unilaterally being extended by the Philippine government to our uh, Filipinos overseas. And of course, you already heard the responses of uh, our government, the FA particularly, and DOLE and OWA uh, in responding to the challenges of the COVID. Next slide, please. So yun lang pong sa pagtigin namin, the civil society, uh, I already mentioned that in the countries of destination, there is exclusion of policies on social protection, particularly for the migrant domestic workers and other low-wage workers like those in the plantation and those bordering in informal work. Anong dahilan? Hindi sila kasama pa sa pag-recognize that they are regular workers. So that remains a challenge. Even if, for example, now uh, many countries of destination have legislated uh, domestic workers' laws. Pero yun, may exclusion kasi tingin nila, ay, mabibigatan ang domestic worker pag magbabayad siya ng social security. And this is the case, for example, of a uh, discussion uh, with Singapore. So they can extend social protection or social security to migrant workers, but then they are saying that now maybe for the migrant domestic workers, you will have to ask them if they are willing to enroll in the social security uh, program of uh, the country of destination. But I think the point is it's for the state to make regulations. So it's not like it's going to be just one, one side only, pay, one party only paying for the contribution because the whole idea of social security is the solidarity uh, contribution, both coming from the workers and from the employers. 
And of course, as already mentioned, mas, mahik, mas mahirap magkaroon ng availment ang, ang mga undocumented workers as also confirmed by the study. Also, and this is, uh, I think, mentioned as well by Dr. Tabuga, there is low level of awareness on the social pro security programs, not only of our government, but uh, more so on the programs uh, available in the countries of destination. And just to reiterate that in terms of old age uh, programs or benefits, there is not much in, that you can find in Asia, like in the case of the GCC, where more than 60% of our migrant workers go to. So how do you address this, these gaps? No, ang nakitang nilagay namin dito, there should be proactive negotiation. This is the bilateral that our government officials were talking about uh, for countries of destination for social protection measures to include, for example, migrant domestic workers. There should be proactive monitoring or oversight uh, for the uh, of, of the private recruitment agencies and employers so that the provisions for social protection in the employment contract are complied with by the employers. And again, as mentioned by Director Joe of OWA, itong panahon ng pandemia when a lot of them had to be repatriated, hindi na nasunod yung mga provisions for uh, return ticket and of course the payment of wages and other benefits nung pinauwi sila because of the pandemic. But at the same time, we see that negotiations should also cover long-term benefits uh, in the countries of destination. So exploring schemes for shared contributions. So how to do that? I, I think this is something that they will have to, to discuss uh, uh, in a sustained manner. No? Next slide, please. Okay, uh, another set of gaps, low level of awareness of the OFWs and the social protection program of the Philippine government. So I think this was also the, the part of the recommendation mentioned in the study and also more on site that they do not know much about these various programs to government. All they know about, the thing is, all they know about is they have to pay, which of course relates to the second recommendation that maybe there's a way that the OEC should be connected to the enrollment to the social security or social uh, protection program of the government. But I think ang isang komentary namin dito, hindi dapat inuugnay yung pagbabayad sa ating mga social security programs doon sa pag-avail ng OEC. And I will expound on that later. No? So the other issue is, of course, problems in the payment of the contributions once the OFW is already overseas. So may hindi lahat ng mga lugar ay merong uh, paraan ng pagbabayad. Of course, al although a lot of these schemes now are being made available online, but I think mahalaga pa rin yung information dissemination. And of course, yung weaker integration program. But hopefully, itong ating pandemic ay nagkaroon ng mga lessons pa to learn on how we can more effectively implement our various reintegration programs. In terms of ways forward, siyempre, aggressively engage in sustained information campaign, devise ways for better, wider reach to OFWs, particularly on site, Revive the Kabayanihan Project. Ano ba itong Kabayanihan Project? You will note that we are paying several social security programs. May PhilHealth, may SSS, may Pag-ibig. Iba-iba yung bayad, pagbabayad dito. So there was already a proposal from these agencies that we could devise a mechanism where isa na lang ang ibabayad mo. Isang bayaran lang and then sila na yung bahalang mag-divide by kung saan ang bayad kanino ahensya. But this unfortunately did not take off the ground. Okay, strengthen NRCO or the National Reintegration Program, but and hopefully this will be addressed by the new department and its programs. Make OWA more strategic in terms of its programs and services, and of course utilize the whole of government and whole of society approach. Next, uh, please. Final comments. <laughs> uh, this is what I'm saying: the social protection or social security is meant to be a solidarity or tripartite program by the social partners, employers, kasama dito, at saka ang gobyerno to regulate and of course the workers themselves. In the case of uh, the migrant, our OFWs, as I said, the various programs uh, of the Philippines are extended to the OFWs. Maganda po yun kasi nga maraming mga bansa na hindi sila hindi available ang social protection programs. But the problem is, iisa lang ang nagbabayad. That, is not, that doesn't uh, reflect the reality that they actually have employers. So kung ang, 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 agree, ang argument ay, ay, but we cannot compare them because of course you are looked upon as a temporary worker, etc. But the thing is, there are other countries of destination.
patients that extend social protection to migrant workers. But very specifically and interestingly, they exclude low wage workers. So again, papasok doon yung mga kababaihan at yung mga mas uh, low skilled, the so called low skilled workers. And I think that word is on discrimination. Okay, and of course, as the ILO would say, this scheme for migrant workers is not sustainable. Tsaka mas maunti yung makukuha mong beneficio kasi mag isa ka lang na nagbabayad. Next slide, please. So key takeaways, number one, we have to invest on social protection programs. Yung mga private insurance providers, pwede naman sila in the here and now, but if you make it mandatory, that's also problematic. So dapat ay ang investment should be coming from the duty bearers to cover the here and now, but also during emergency situations and definitely for long-term protection benefits as well. It must be in inclusive, effectively accessed and enjoyed by all, including migrant workers. So again, we cannot buy forever the argument that, oh, you're just temporary worker. Oh, you have to pay for your own. Because in other countries, professional migrant workers are offered very, very um, attractive package of benefits, including social protection. But then they always make uh, exception. Those among low wage workers, nothing. So, but I'm, what we're saying is, we should promote that the ones who have less must have more in terms of social protection. Because there are social protection floors na pinag-usapan na, na wala dapat yung manchadong sad sad sa kahirapan, no? And of course, this whole issue of portability of benefits and totalization of contributions should be uh, really studied very seriously and that may entail uh, legal frameworks uh, being revisited kung hindi applicable sa context ng mga migrant workers but then increasingly we see that workers are mobile they cross borders no so hindi pwedeng excuse na oh this is only designed specifically for the local workers and dami ng migrant workers they cross borders left and right so i think we, we have to revisit the policies of the countries of origin and destination regional igo like the asean should also be harmonized and simplified to make it more inclusive next uh, slide please Ah, ito po, sabi kasi ng PIDS, magpakilala daw ang CMA. So, ito po yun, mabilis lang po. Kami po yan, marami mga kababaihan. Next slide, please. So, ito po yung aming vision. Kami po ay mahilig mangarap ng isang lipunan na may justicia, good governance, equal opportunity, and gender equality. At kasama po ang migrants. Hindi pwedeng mga local lang ng mga mamamayan. So, next slide, please. So this vision is translated through these various programs, which was also which was which were already mentioned by our uh, facilitator. Next, so yung pung ano lang just to zero in on ano ba yung mga efforts namin to promote social uh, security protection for our migrant workers. Next slide, please. So ito po, marami. So syempre, addressing the issue of wage theft, as we call it, we also participated in one of the webinars. I mentioned the uh, ASEC. Uh, Cortez, yung GCM, uh, there was this objective 22 on the portability of social security and other earned benefits. So yan ay kasama na sa inaartikuli sa international community. Pero marami talaga yung usapin na pangangailangan ng information dissemination. Yung isang picture ko, nakasa, hindi po ako, nag, uh, hindi ako madre dito, but this is in the church in, tai, in Taiwan. At hindi po nila alam ang mandatory insurance na nasa ating batas. Ito namang picture na kasama po yung mga taga, mga senator natin. This was when the Senate ratified our social security agreement with Japan. The only one in Asia na meron po tayong social security agreement. Kasi ibig sabihin, nagkakaroon tayo ng portability of benefits at saka totalization of our contributions kung ikaw po ay migrant workers in Japan. And where this is not possible, like we've, we've been trying to negotiate for a social security agreement with uh, Italy for more than 20 years. Tapos nag out sila. Ang maganda dito, na very recently, I think only this year, they established an office in the Philippines. Yung pong tawag nila ay patronato office na pwede po silang tumulong sa pag-facilitate ng pag-access nila ng social security and social protection na nung pinag-nagtrabaho sila ng maraming taon sa Italia. 
So mag-contact lang po kayo dito sa Patronato office for those who work in Italy. Of course, very recently, we also conducted a social protection uh, uh, consultation uh, for our migrant workers in the ASEAN. And as I mentioned, uh, in 2020, 2012, we conducted a study on the state of affairs of our migrant workers in terms of accessing social security. Next slide, pa narinig ko na yung aking time is up. <laughs> but, but if, so, yan po, marami mga efforts, especially during the pandemic, to inform our migrants of the various programs of government. Siyempre po, ang favorito, napangit ni Director Jo, yun pong ating Dole Akap. Hanggang ngayon po, nagpapasilitate pa rin kami kasi marami pa rin din po ang nag-apply at hindi pa nakatanggap. <laughs> Next slide. At yun po, nag, uh, hindi po kami nag-aayuda, but then I think sa panahon ng pandemya, kahit ano pong pwedeng maitulong, I can go a long way. So whether it's the PPE being requested, at syempre, nagpatulong kami sa OWA para i-transport yung mga PPE sa Bohol. Next slide, please. Uh, Ayan po, nag-ayuda kami. So, from Luzon, Visayas at Mindanao po yan. So, kahit pa paano yung nakatulog sa ating mga repatriated migrants from the, in the time of the pandemic. Next slide, please. I think uh, mga ganyan na po yung aming program, yung iba pang slides. Next. So, ayan po, mga nag-post po. Yung po yung mga OFCs na partners natin, like itong ating mga kasama sa Negros, ay sila po ang nag-post ng picture at senior sa amin. So, salamat po. Di nakita nyo, totohanan po yung mga ayuda nila. So, next. Tapos na ba? Meron pa ba? Meron pa po ba? Maganda yung term ng Lucena, eh. Bayanihan sa ating mga bagong bayani. <laughs> Meron po, next slide. Ah, salamat na po pala. <laughs> so, thank you for your attention. So, salamat po. At maraming salamat uh, din po. Um, Executive Director Ellen uh, Sana of the Center for Migrant Advocacy. Thank you very much, ma'am. And may I add that um, Ms. Uh, Ellen is also represents the migrant sector in the National Tripartite Industrial Peace Council and Recent Work Advisory Committee. Thank you very much again, ma'am, for uh, the practical and uh, I, I think visible recommendations that you uh, shared with us um, in response to the um, gaps uh, that um, our researchers at PIDS have seen in their uh, two studies. Okay, marami salamat po. So, friends, um, we have heard the reactions and insights of our uh, discussions, and this time we would like to hear from you. So we have come to the next part of our webinar, which is the open forum. But but before I start reading your question, let's uh, give our uh, speakers a um, a short break before they start entertaining your question. So let's have a poll, and this poll is open to our webinar participants and our uh, uh, viewers on Facebook. So we have a just very simple question taken from the uh, presentation of uh, Dr. Tabuga. So the question is now flashed on the screen. I now invite you to participate in this poll. So the question is, in addition to the ARMM, which, reg which uh, regions have the highest proportion of households with OFWs? Is it A, uh, Calabarzon, uh, Metro Manila, and Ilocos region? B, Cagayan Valley, Ilocos region, and Metro Manila? Or C, Ilocos region, Bicol region, and Central Visayas? Okay, so in addition to ARMM, which regions have the highest proportion of households with OFWs, I will no longer uh, read uh, the choices. You can uh, see that on the screen. So we are giving you uh, 10 seconds to answer this poll question. And uh, when, just let us know if the time is up. Okay, Thanks so uh, I'm now closing the poll. Okay, and. Um, let us give Webex um, a few minutes to process the answers. Okay. Ten more so, seconds. Okay. So, what do you think is the answer? If I may ask Director uh, uh, Doctor Tabuga, uh, what is the answer based on your presentation? Letter B. Yes, the answer is letter B. So, let us look at the results. Ah, okay. Letter B only. Uh, ten um of uh, 
of our WebEx participants who participated in this poll got it right. So, akala nila mas maraming nagsagot ng A. <laughs> okay. So, as a token of our appreciation, we will uh, pick uh, randomly uh, two, uh, uh, two names from uh, those who answered B and uh, we will give them a prize. At the same time, bibigyan din po namin ng premium yung po nag-participate sa Facebook at nakakuha ng tamang sagot. And I will um, announce the winners of our poll uh, before we close the webinar. Okay? So, at this point, I now invite our speakers, our presenter, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Tabuga, and our three discussants to the open forum. So, let us now, um, let me check our chat box for the questions. Okay? So let us start with um okay let us start with the question of um Katrina Sanchez uh and this is uh to all uh the panelists no okay um aside from financial assistance and other subsidies are there capacity building programs for the returning OFWs in place and if there are what is the status of its implementation so this refers to uh I think the reintegration programs uh, for our OFWs who have uh, returned home. So if I may direct this question to um, um, to Director Ajo of the uh, uh, OWA, and then I can also ask uh, probably uh, ASEC um, Cortez, and perhaps also we can ask uh, um, E.B. Okay, we can also ask our Executive Director, E.D. Um, Ellen, as uh, the CMA may also have uh, some of their initiatives for, some initiatives for returning OFWs. Okay, Director Jo, you, ha you have the floor. Thank you again, Ms. Sheila. Uh, to answer the question, are there recommendations or reflections in promoting non-contributory schemes of social protection? Uh, well, you know, in uh, in several of the set, um, uh, during... the, sorry, but the question yes. was uh, aside from financial assistance and other subsidies, are there capacity building programs for returning OFWs in place? And if there are, uh, what is the status of its implementation? All right, all right. Uh, actually, our capacity building programs are more direct assistance to to returnees. Um, uh, in several pathways. For instance, uh, for those looking for local employment, local jobs, we have we have specific partnership with uh, government and private sector. Okay, uh, like in uh, the OTR transportation, we have partnered for the Philippine with the Philippine National Railways for the skills training and re the retooling of returnees to. Uh, uh, for jobs, uh, about 30,000, I think, would be the demand in uh, railways of uh, industry. So that's the kind of partnership we have, for instance, in the government sector. In the private sector, we have a uh, partnership with uh, Coca-Cola, with Suising, etc., mainly to help in the start startups and mentoring uh, for new businesses and even enhancement and uh, other capacity building that requires skills training upskilling uh, business uh, uh, business uh, te and technology training you know uh, uh, we are still um, uh, looking forward to the opening of more uh, skills training provider. You see, during the pandemic, talagang bumaba yung aming capacity building programs because they were this uh, were temporarily uh, closed, closed down uh, during the pandemic. So we hope in the next uh, few months uh, we are up and uh, about again on our capacity building programs. Thank you. Marami salama, Director Cho. And um, Asik Cortez, would you like to uh, share your, uh, um, give your answer to this question, sir? 
Sure. Um, while uh, the Philippine consulate or the Philippine embassy does not really come up with the programs for returning for return. Filipinos, what we do is try to come up with capacity building programs for Filipinos who are, all st who are still uh, active in mm -hmm. the places where they work. So we come up, we come up with several programs. Like for instance, in Dubai, we had a year long uh, financial literacy program, which goes through four different modules to allow our overseas Filipinos to understand what it means to be um, financially literate in terms of savings, in terms of investments, in terms of understanding other uh, markets like the stock market and, and so forth mm -hmm. and so on. Um, uh, fin uh, franchising, uh, entrepreneurship, leadership, and so forth and so on. Now, this with the hope of giving them an idea what it means to be financially literate in, 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 in anticipation of if and when they have to return to the Philippines, if and when they have to go home. And uh, this is one of the what the flagship programs of the uh, of, of, of our embassy then. And uh, many of the other embassies and consulates also come up with a similar uh uh, program, although not not in the same manner as the one, uh, not not uniform again tailor made to the needs of that particular community, and obviously it's something that uh, it has to be sustained. It not just for the not just for the time that I was there, but something that has to be uh, you know congen in congen out or whoever is in there and dun parin yung programang yon. And of course, it all boils down to how uh, how our how we educate our people. Uh, when we mean educate, not just for those who are ready to go out of the country and go uh, test the waters as far as overseas employment is concerned, but also for for our for the young, for the for the children as young as uh, in grade school or in high school na embed na sa kanila what it means to be an entrepreneur an innovator uh, a manager and so forth and so on so that when they go out abroad uh, meron na silang set skills a, a lifetime worth of uh, programs that that make them um, winners uh, in their in their minds mm -hmm. thank you very much Asa Cortez and uh ED Ellen uh would uh CMA have any um you know programs for returning OFWs, you may want to share uh, this program. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, 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 From okay. our yeah. end, one, I, siguro yung isa, I, natin sa mga, hello? Yeah? Am I audible? Hello, yes, okay ba yung yes. aking audio? Yes, okay na po ma'am. Okay. Um, so, go ahead. Yeah, okay. So, uh, dun sa question ni Katrina, kung meron capacity building, there are many capacity building uh, programs that the various agencies of government uh, offer to uh, migrant workers and other uh, Filipinos na gustong mag-engage sa business, etc. So for most of these would be the TESDA, the TI, the OST, and the families of the Department of Agriculture. From our end, so hindi yun ang usapin. Ang ginagawa namin ay how do we finance for these uh, business uh, or livelihood projects? Kaya para they will take ownership of it, they will take stock of ano ba yung skills ko or kulang na skills ko. Ano yung mga assets, resources na available at yet ay we do this in a collective manner utilizing mga family circles. So nandun po yung trust and then mga briefly. Thank you. Okay. Yes ma'am, your connection is choppy but but uh, we're more than pleased, ma'am, that you're you're here with us. Oh, and uh, oh, oh, oh. yes, so oh, oh. <laughs> yes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, okay, let's move to another question. And this time, this is um, from Maria Victoria Evangelista. So let me read her question. More than raising awareness of migrant workers, government agencies concerned should exert effort to ensure that migrant workers appreciate the benefits of social protection. Are there recommendations or reflections, particularly in terms of also promoting non-contributory schemes of social protection, uh, which may serve as complementary social assistance? So uh, may I um, start with, uh, with Aubrey, with Dr. Tabuga? 
would you have uh, would you like to share your insights to this question are there recommendations or reflections particularly in terms of also promoting non-contributory schemes of social protection yes um thank you for that question uh, i think right now my my mind is like um, thinking of all the other um, mm -hmm. call programs, uh, because I think for for us to um, really learn from our experience from this pandemic, I think we have to be more innovative. So, isipin na natin lahat ng mga pwede nating um, gawin ngayon, kasi um, an event such as this can really, you know, bring us back to like. Uh, 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 zero yung yung ating mga mga savings even for i i'm i'm from a ofw family and um i i can understand their situation so um magkaroon lang ng isang nagkasakit this is a ofw family it's really very uh scary and very problematic so i think uh that for now for for the government um given also the cost no the cost of managing all this um uh the repatriation and all that um perhaps uh, we can all think of the the ways na ano ba um in kailangan ba nating magput up ng new funds um is the welfare funds that we're having right now um adequate ba sila or do we need to innovate to be innovative and think of uh, other types of funds that you know migrant workers can um can tap when they come back ngayon kasi um um Sheila knows this because um I'm uh, my, my father uh, was you know FW and he died uh, working abroad um so I was the one who received him received his coffin and all that so what he got was the OWA and so I know and I've benefited our family benefited from that but um if uh, the circumstances were different like kung nagretire siya na alive um since hindi siya kumbaga since ang work niya is you know elementary occupation he worked as a an operator of uh, of a matawag doon heavy equipment so maliit lang talaga yung sweldo niya at karamihan sa Saudi kasi Saudi siya ganun yung work so um hindi mo hindi mo ma ang sabi nila even even for people that we've talked uh, recently because we are also doing some, some studies about the effects of the pandemic and sabi nila ah, hindi namin ma hindi kami kakapag benefit din sa owa if we don't die like our family won't be able to won't be able to benefit from it so inisip ko like uh, what if when they come back they can benefit from a fund that uh, mm -hmm. yeah tama yung sinabi kasi na, karina na that has to be like a tripartite mechanism for for this social protection so maybe like that like if if someone who worked abroad for 10 years or maybe 13 years um my husband also worked abroad for 13 years <laughs> so um uh pagdating niya so kasi ang hirap kasing i sabihin that oh dapat mag save kayo mag invest mm -hmm. people they, they it depends on their circumstances like what where to put their money as I've said, kung yung 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 worker ang ang kanyang uh, ma ang kanyang uh, mindset, mindset. Is just to 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 invest in the children. That's usually ganon ang Pilipino eh. So I education and children, and then pag pagtanda nila, um that children will look after them. So ganon yung ganon yung uh, paniniwala. But um maganda sana like for for my my father na kung umuwi siya ng <laughs> ng mas na hindi ganon um na may makukuha siya um i don't i don't know i'm still thinking about that um ano bang mga funds pa yung pwede nating mm -hmm. kumbaga explore um can we are, are there best practices abroad or models that we can maybe um emulate ganon mm -hmm. so that hindi lang tayo um i i i, I appreciate all the efforts that our government did for our migrant workers sa pandemic na to sobra sobra po silang spoiled like kasabi po ng husband ko kasi umuwi siya from Saudi so sobra daw silang spoiled sobrang so parang ako naman natutuwa ako kasi um, we can give back to our OFWs but at the same time naubusan ng <laughs> I'm sure naubusan po ng pondo ang gobyerno but um, at the back of my mind, uh, paano kaya natin to mapaghahandaan things like this in the future, uh, both from the end of the government, like, um, do we need to like institute like funding for like, I don't know, a welfare fund or I don't know what 
you call those funds or from the end of the worker ano kaya yung pwede niyang gawin um mm -hmm. sabi na naman nila pagbabayarin niyo na naman kami but uh, yun nga kailangan talaga din sila educate na um eto po ay para sa inyo uh, mm -hmm. para din sa pamilya niyo hindi lang sa inyo kasi tama yung sinabi kanina we are so family centric um mm -hmm. na iniisip natin yung family natin pero hindi natin alam na hindi natin nare-realize minsan that if we don't take good care of ourselves sila din ang mahihirapan sa atin so yeah i, I think um we have to explore we have to be more innovative na alam ko shadow talented ang, ang Pilipino so i think we should yeah I, i i talk too much thank you Sheila thank you very much Al. um let me uh, give the floor now to uh, Director Joe. You know, Director Joe, uh, we would appreciate your insight on this. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Well, you know, it pains me to say no to an OFW who have contributed several times to, to OWA. And then uh, mm -hmm. because uh, he or she is no longer entitled because umuwi na siya, mm -hmm. na siya, wala na siyang bagong kontrata, etc. You know, um, um, Dr. Tabuga, in one of those Senate deliberations on the bill, when it was a bill in the Department of Migrant uh, Act, uh, one section there, uh, yun namin, yun section 20, it's about OWA. Okay. Okay. It, it, it was almost uh, with a provision that says that OWA should transition to a provident fund. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. Ito po ay ano po, si Senator uh, Drillon po. Okay, inter, uh, uh, interjected on that. Uh, but you know, uh, kung transition ng OWA fund, eh, hindi ka kayanin. Kasi we're only 18.6 billion. Kukonti pa, hindi ho kaya na, let's say for one, uh, all active OWA may claim disability, death, o ganon. Uh, mm -hmm. Ano lang, theoretical lang, hindi po talaga kaya ibigay yun. Uh, but then again, ang maganda dun, nag-evolve yung section 20 na yun on OWA fund, mm -hmm. saying that uh, now the SSS is part of the Board of Trustees. Okay? And the provision also says to have an actuarial study on mm -hmm. the life of the OWA fund. Okay? Such that, ano yung pwedeng gawin to extend it? Maybe there's another law that says now we have provident fund that would complement OWA fund. Yan po, para po makover yung ganong instances kagaya sa father ni Dr. Tabuga. Such mm -hmm. that, uh, paano nga naman kung hindi uh, OWA active member, pero dati mga OWA contributors, hindi na sila uh, makakuha ng disability, debt, uh, mm -hmm. benefits, etc. So, um, uh, 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 our hopes are high here in OWA na mm -hmm. it will come uh, starting with the study on the actual uh, fund of OWA and then mm -hmm. siguro uh, the, there can be some legislative efforts for on our part na sumusog sa isang uh, bill mm -hmm. para po sa isang provident fund following the model of the SSS okay. but tama po may, dapat siguro yan ano yung socialize meaning uh, kapag kayong those less with more, with more okay so hindi may meron sigurong bracket for those skilled and professional workers and those that have less uh, to to have more benefits so i i think it's possible ha, fingers crossed <laughs> uh, papunta naman na po doon talaga ang uh, reflections po thank you yes maraming salamat director Joe. we're looking forward to that actuarial study and hopefully nga it will pave the way to uh, you know having that a provident fund no for our um OFW so this is really good news marami pong salamat actually i have a follow up question regarding the department of migrant workers but before that let me uh, go let us go first to Asek Cortez Asek you may want to contribute to uh, this question sir if uh, you want to definitely uh, one of the things that the doctor Tabuga had mentioned a while back was uh, the ease uh, for our compliance to enroll in various health social protection programs. And in the middle of the pandemic in 2020, I was in the middle of a uh, of an information war between PhilHealth and the overseas Pinoys of UAE. And it caused so much uh, debate because there was the provision of having the uh, PhilHealth contributions increase from 2.5 per year until it reaches 5% in 
2024. And um, apparently many of our Kababayans felt that they were not consulted enough. And this had become an issue because, uh, you know, at Kung sa Philippines, eh, you know, you have one half uh, contribution mo, employer mo, while is ikaw yung kalahati. Sa abroad, it's all 5%. And 2.5% is a lot uh, of money for our overseas Pinoy's. Of course, when you try to explain to them that all these redound to the benefit of their family members naman back here in the Philippines, dun lang nila naiintindihan. But again, there is that very, very seeming discon uh, disconnect between how uh, policies are made and formulated uh, for our overseas Filipinos, and yet it doesn't seem to jibe with, uh, you know, with with what is uh, what the overseas Filipinos or what society wants. And this is what I meant when it, when how how important it is for studies uh, and and actuarial studies such as the one with uh, of Dr. Tabuga to come up with, uh, you know concrete ways of uh, coming up with regulations that will eventually redound to the benefit of our kababayans. And this is very, very uh, important. At the same time, um, you know, we, we've also been in the middle of, uh, of people asking for assistance in the middle of the pandemic. And I remember uh, I was just commiserating with my, uh, uh, the, the labor attache in, in Dubai because Dole ACAP reached about a hundred thousand applications in Dubai alone when the uh, you know when the what do you call this the number of uh, the quota was something like seven thousand to begin with, and obviously lahat yan, uh, it was just uh, very difficult to manage and you know sometimes people just don't understand because they're already you know they they've shut down their their, their processes or they didn't know exactly how the government uh, systems work and. Um, it, it, it was a tough time uh, for government at that uh, during the pandemic because we tried to explain one you cannot <laughs> government has limited resources uh, finite condition infinite uh, God knows what happens if we had infinite resources no but uh, here we are grappling with a few uh, million or even a billion budget for our, the, those asking for assistance and yet uh, you know there, there has to be a sort of uh, closer interaction so that na intindihan yung mga tao ito mga regulations and policies na ito again which we did not pluck out of thin air and I remember our experiences with the labor attache was just you know it was one of the most tiring and uh, most stressful uh, days because we were expected to work triple time for our kababayans and we do that but at the same time because you know, hindi naman uh, forever yung budget na ibinigay sa'yo talagang konti lang ang maano mo and this was the hard part trying to explain what it means to have finite resources for an infinite number of uh, requests uh, from our kababayans Thank you very much Asa Cortez and now may I call on uh, uh, E.D. Ellen E.D. Ellen are you still there? Hello? Okay. Hello, E.D. Ellen? Okay, I think uh, she's having problems with her internet uh, connection. E.D. Ellen, uh, you, can, you may type your, uh, your input or your um, answer to that question. Hello? Hello? Okay, ma'am, go ahead po. Yes, ma'am, we can hear you po. Oh, yes, ma'am, kaya lang choppy po oh yung connection nyo. <laughs> yes, ah, okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. Ma'am, unfortunately okay. po, we can can't you, hear you. I can try my other connection. Is this better? Yes, ma'am, that's better po. Is this better or not? It's it's okay, ma'am, you may try. Uh, you could, could You could try now po. Hi, ma'am. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if E.D. Uh, Ellen is, uh, E.D. Helen can hear me. Uh, I'm using, yes, uh, I'm using my other account. Yes, ma'am, I can hear you. We can hear you, ma'am. You may try now. You may speak now, po. Uh, okay, so, <laughs> okay, gusto ko lang pong sabihin, number one, in terms of social protection and safety nets, we I think we should commend the Philippine government. Kasi wala pang COVID ay ang dami na niyang mga social protection measures. How come I hear my... 
Ma'am, I think uh, yeah. Yes, so, ma'am. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. So yeah, so I'm saying that uh uh, compared to many countries of the origin, ang Pilipinas lang po ang nagpo-provide ng maraming social protection. Sabi nga ni Dr. Tabuga, parang spoiled na nga eh, yung panahon ng COVID. But the thing is, even prior to COVID, meron ng policies in place yung ating gobyerno, both DFA and uh, the Dole family, particularly OWA, to extend social protection to our migrants. Kasama din dito yung mga provisions in the employment contract. Sabi nga ni Ase Cortez, yung usapit yung proyekto nila ng, ng uh, bringing home Anyone, any Filipino na kailangang umuwi, papauwiin nila yon. Hindi pinag-uusapan yung pandemic, with or without the pandemic. Kaya lang, ang, yan po yung mga in the immediate, the welfare programs that are available. But what we're saying as well, na dapat ay mahalagang paghahandaan din natin, is in the medium and long term. Kaya yung mga old age pension and programs, dapat ay pinag-iisipan din natin kasi mag-50 uh, years na nga po yung overseas employment. At siguro, really, sasagutin ko na rin, may, may tanong dito si Mr. Ferdinand Magibin kung pa possible ba yung sinasabi kong scheme ng Social Security for our OFWs. Yes po, this is already uh, uh, being implemented sa case ng ating seafarers where the money agencies that are based in the Philippines act as the employers. So sila po yung nagko-contribute ng share ng employer. At syempre yung ating mga marino ang nagko-contribute ng share nila in the SSS. So nagagawa yan kasi yung ating mga money agencies ang nag a on behalf of the employers or the principals on the basis of the joint and several liability. Pero challenge po yan sa land base. Yung mga big companies, I think in the past, like yung mga Aramco, parang nagkaroon sila na pwedeng mag-contribute sila. But then I don't know now the status of that. But that said, I think again yung gusto ko lang pong i-emphasize ay hindi dapat lang na tayo yung nag-iisip ng protection ng ating workers, especially when they are already on site, spending many years of their productive life, life contributing to the economic and social development of those countries. And again, ang sinasabi ko, hindi siya imposible kasi in many countries, it can be done include, mm -hmm. to include migrant workers in their social security program. Ang problema sa Gulf states, for example, they do not have that. But what they have is the end of service benefits. Mahalaga rin po yan na alam ng ating mga migrant workers at the same time. Kasi nga, given the situation where the migrants contribute solely to the SSS and PhilHealth and Pag-ibig, yung ESB becomes more attractive because they don't contribute to it. So kung matagal silang nagtrabaho, then they get the end of service benefits. And this is the same, for example, in Korea. Try to force social security agreement in Korea. So, I think natin yung sinabi ni, ni, ni Director Jo na given itong bagong uh, departamento, convert yung OWA, but something to SSS. Mm -hmm. Reach out to the countries of destination and they should be helpful well in looking after the welfare of our migrant workers. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much, um, E.D. Uh, ED Ellen. Okay, so let's move to other questions. And let at, at this point, um, may I uh, direct my question to um, Director Joe? And this concerns about, well, you uh, it was uh, the Department of Migrant Workers, you already mentioned this earlier. So we all know that, uh, well, basically it integrates the existing offices concerned with migrant affairs under one roof. Could you provide us, ma'am, uh, if you can, with updates regarding the uh, the loss implementation? Uh, ano, ano na po ba ang uh, status ngayon ng implementation sa pagbubuo nitong Depar Department of Migrant Workers? Thank you. Um... Uh, from what I know, uh, as of now, uh, there is a uh, there's an implementing rules and regulations because uh, 60 days after the publication of the, the of the of the DMW Act, uh, the IRR should be issued, 
And um, from what I know, it requires, uh, other than the IRR, is for the stopping pattern to be provided by DBM. And of course, the 2023 budget. So given those three conditions, uh, the Department of Migrant Workers can take off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you very much for that update, uh, Director Shaw. And um, if I may, I have I have a question for um, um, Ace Cortez because we have this um, you know regional uh, regional fora. We have a regional platform like the ASEAN, wherein we can advance the uh, the um, welfare of our uh, Filipino migrant workers. So how are how is the Philippines taking advantage or utilizing, let's say, the the ASEAN in order to um, you know, um, fix the gaps in terms of, you know, uh, provision of assistance to our migrant workers or um, solving solving issues uh, that confront them. Uh, right now, we have the ASEAN consensus for the protection on the protection and promotion of our migrant workers. So, how is the uh, how is the Philippines utilizing this? Uh, you know. Um, opportunities that we have in, in the ASEAN. Thank you, Dr. Sheila. After my stint in uh, Honolulu, I uh, became the director, uh, one of the directors at the ASEAN office here before leaving for Dubai and then coming over here. Now, one of the things that uh, you have to remember with regard to ASEAN is that it works on um, consensus, so which means 10 or none. If uh, mm -hmm. one country does not agree, then the whole thing does not uh, push forward. And then you must also understand that in terms of migration, uh, maraming ASEAN ang labor sending and at the same time, receiving destination countries so when you see uh, when you have destination countries you're speaking of thailand you're speaking mm -hmm. of malaysia you're speaking of singapore and uh, philippines you know and and the rest would be the labor sending ones and this is one of the more challenging portions when it comes to asean mm -hmm. now uh, we've uh, the philippines has always been very very proactive in terms of pushing its uh, priorities and one of the priorities as i had mentioned is the promotion and protection of uh, our overseas filipinos wherever they are and uh, the asean has been in the forefront of our migration uh, uh, endeavors and policies as well now there are one of the uh, one of the uh, one of the more useful naging very useful uh, ASEAN um, uh, efforts would be uh, rip assistance of na ASEAN nationals in third countries. So, kunwari, meron tayo mga nationals in country X na wala tayong representation doon. Nandun yung ibang ASEAN countries at the same time. So, tumutulong sila not only for uh, their nationals, pero pati na rin para sa mga kap kapwa ASEAN nationals sa atin. Halimbawa, in uh, just just recently, a few weeks ago sa so Ukraine, we, um, the Thailand and the Philippines uh, partnered and joined together para mag-hire ng isang bus uh, or two buses, bringing Thai and Filipinos from the border to, to Warsaw, from, from Ukraine to Warsaw. Okay. And this is uh, not, not only that, meron din nangyari a um, couple of years ago in, in during the um, prior to the breakout uh, of uh, hostilities in, in Yemen, where Malaysia helped us with our Filipino students who were there. And, and all these show that the cooperation within ASEAN as far as migration is concerned and assistance to our nationals abroad is very active, even if nagkakaiba tayo ng perspective when it comes to the, uh, uh, you know, how, how, pe how people should have... Uh, uh, the, the sort of protection they have, the sort of benefits they have, considering the labor con labor uh, sending iba, iba naman destination countries. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So again, uh, not only with ASEAN, but the Philippines has been very and extremely active uh, when it comes to, um, you know, migration policies. The problem, though, with being the best is that you don't have any everybody anyone to emulate. Sinabi nga ni Dr. Tabuga kanina, sana there's a pro program where we can emulate the others, but the others are only emulating us. And uh, we have we have to think of this ourselves. And um, this is something that uh, we're very, very proud of because uh, tama, uh, at the risk of being spoiled and entitled, you mga overseas Filipinos natin when it comes to the gov uh, with you, to government programs, enjoy the best programs there are anywhere else in the world. And this is the hard part though, because we have no act to follow. 
but to trailblaze ourselves. Thank you very much, Jose Cortez, for that. Okay, um, I think this is already the last question. I'm I'm looking at the chat box, and um, there's one. Okay, one question left, and this one is from Min Ninfa Tokilio, who is the president of the Federation of OFWs in Bacolod. Thank you very much, Mom, for um, attending our webinar and. Um, her question is, uh, do you think ordinances and policies pertaining to the wellness of, of our OFWs are effectively implemented? And should there, should there be an ampli amplification to these laws or not? Okay, uh, very um, thought-provoking question from, okay, uh, may I repeat it? Uh, do you think ordinances and policies pertaining to the wellness of our OFWs are effectively implemented and should there be an amplification to these laws or not? Um, okay, may I start with the uh, uh, Dr. Tabuga? Ow. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> coming from a family of OFWs, I should know if there are wellness programs or is is that uh, about wellness programs or is this uh, about probably health? welfare probably okay. welfare programs? yeah welfare uh, or, or, yeah. or even health uh maybe health, uh, yes uh, yes or of our OFWs. yeah social um, programs in general probably this is in general okay so right now um sorry i'm not aware of 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 these um uh, programs on wellness but um there are initiatives like uh recently i am a member of a of a network about the and uh, promoting migrants health and there are um researchers um and going there so i think in terms of efforts um not really policies but uh, uh more on the efforts i think we have lots of um ngos you know doing also this in terms of promoting their welfares and uh, whether there are effectively implemented um there are lots of i think studies that look into this uh but uh i haven't really done any like uh, systematic reviews but uh, given the multitude of of these bodies going uh, i mean doing this kinds of of, of um, programs or initiatives uh, i think um um people like like for instance, my, my relatives who are FWs, they, they always find themselves um, benefiting from, from this. Um, yeah, so um, amplification, I think, of course, health, um, like for me, I'm, I mean, I personally think that taking care of our OFWs and even all, all, all the workers, um, it's important uh, for us to really um, yeah, kaya nga health insurance din yung tinitingnan natin. Uh, mm -hmm. That's why. Because it, OFWs are are exposed to work environments that are extreme. Um, if you're talking about working in the desert or working in very high, uh, high, uh, highly stressful environments, um, yeah, I think uh, th these kinds of programs are, are very important. And um, I, I, I'm also uh, an advocate of um, local uh, government programs for OFWs because mas, mas malapit sila eh. So, kasi usually ang sinasabi ng mga OFWs, um, hindi na alam yung program na yun, um, they're not aware. Naririnig lang nila sa mga social networks nila. Uh, this is also a, a, a subject of, of my researches, yung kanilang networks. But they don't hear it uh, Although they hear it sometimes, they because malayo sila. So I think the local kind of local base policies or local base interventions for all these kinds of welfare or wellness or health and education, um, I, I'm for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Aubrey. Uh, before I go to our uh, other uh, uh, discussions, allow me to read the um, our, um, comment or response from. Um, uh, Director Ellen, um, according to her, the 2018 National Mental Health includes provision for migrant workers, but I think not yet being put in place. We now have um, the Philippine Migrant Health Network comprising uh, government offices and NGOs to discuss health policy issues of migrants. And of course, the Universal Health Care Act of 2019. Uh, pero parang ang emphasize ay ang contribution ng OFWs. Okay, thank you very much for that input, uh, E.D. Ellen. Okay, if I may go to um, uh, Director Joe, you may want to uh, you may want to uh, answer this question, ma'am. 
Yes, Miss Sheila, definitely. Uh, you know, uh, the, the question pertains to the welfare of OFWs and uh, the issues surrounding it. Uh, paid salaries and um, treatment, um, end of service benefits. You know, OWA, more than the economic benefit of it, is really for the welfare. Okay. Uh, we, uh, the Magnet Workers Act uh, mandates us to, to conduct conciliation. Uh, whenever there are labor issues, so we have, uh, we can call the employers or representatives in the agency and come together to a settlement of conciliation uh, before a person would choose to be repatriated. But then, uh, you know, uh, in 2019, based on our data, we conduct the conciliation also here in Manila. Uh, we call it the single entry approach. Okay. Uh, in 2019, uh, we have settled uh, uh, with money re uh, restitution of about uh, 300, 000, 300 million. Okay. This is the amount of the settlement that we have facilitated uh, when it comes to claims of our OFWs here in Manila and in the regional offices uh, under the Joint and Solidarity Liability. And, but then in 2020 and 2021, when we were at the pandemic, um, it, it fell to a half, you know. Uh, naging 185 million na lamang po yung mga settlement agreement natin in totality. Which says that hirap talaga kami during the pandemic to help facilitate social justice for um, uh, OFWs who left behind unpaid salaries and service benefits, plus of course yung mga damages for being stranded, walang pagkain, mm -hmm. etc. Um, we have teleconferences. Ganun na lang kami nag-operate. Walang face-to-face -face, eh. So, sarado mga offices, we do all this. So, dadating na lang sila kapag mayroon ng settlement at kukunin na ang kanilang pera. But you know, looking back at it, there is still much to be done. Okay, uh, in terms of welfare, handling uh, welfare cases under the Joint and Solidarity Liability, ibig po kasi sabihin, uh, liable din yung agency na nagpaalis dito with the uh, obligations ng employer. But we're saying, but what I think should be done is a mechanism that would maximize yung conciliation natin or even demand the demand uh, claims from the employers doon pa lang at hindi na pagdating dito kasi ang hirap na pag dumating na dito eh. so uh doon there is so much uh, uh so much to be done pa in that area okay yung imaltrato um abuses etc to be at least compensated for that or uh, to get justice doon pa lamang po at hindi yung uh, bayaran kita ng konti dito, i-waiver mo na yan, umuwi ka na, bahala ka na doon sa Pilipinas. Okay? So, so that one area. Uh, kung paano po to, 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 you know, push for, uh, to push employers and the agencies there for on their obligations, including social benefits and social insurance. Sila naman po talaga dapat ang nagpo-provide niyan. Should be at no cost to the workers. Okay? Yun nga lang sabi ni Ma'am Ellen sana, problema si OFW ang ending ang nababayan. Okay? So that's one. Ah, uh, dito sa Pilipinas, um nakita ko siguro that requires nga ayuda sa sa in terms of legislation yung magkaroon ng help desk at the barangay level. Okay. Uh, I know that the AMW would would bring up uh, regional offices later, but then again, if we bring uh, the help desk right there in the barangay, uh, that would allow uh, complaints, reporting of incident incidences by the families of the OFWs at nakakunek sila sa atin, wired to us, mas baka mas mabilis. Uh, 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 you know, in emergency situation, uh, the the quicker it is, the better for ano to for the quick response. So, uh, offhand, yung po yung naisip ko po talaga given our you know our experiences in the pandemic. Thank you. Maraming salamat, uh, Director uh, Joe. And uh, may I uh, give the floor to uh, Asi Cortez, uh, sir? Your thoughts on uh, on on whether 
you know, the current uh, welfare program um, welfare programs are uh, sufficient, and if there is any for amplific amplification to existing laws, sir. Sure. Um, we do not live in a vacuum. Uh, changes happen. Changes occur. The profile of our overseas Filipinos change, the education level, and so forth and so on, they change, which means there is always a constant need to update our programs for our people. And this is not just in terms of foreign policy or domestic policy or labor policy, but in, in all aspects of uh, government as well. So while the Philippines is doing uh, well, we have enough uh, for now. Again, in the in the in five ten years, we may need uh, people to nudge us, nudge government, and tell us, "Oi, me no me 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 konting pagkakaiba na." In fact, look at this study. Baka naman baka pw pwede natin ibahin. And this is what is, I think very important when it comes to liaising with our academic uh, brothers and sisters, uh, with the academe, with with PIDS, for instance, so that palaging updated ang DFA ang OWA. Or in this in the next few years and bmw when it comes to understanding what our people need and um while as i say while everything is okay seemingly okay now in the in five ten years magkakaiba na naman ang profile at ang circumstance sa mga kababayan natin which may necessitate changes or or you know pagbawas or pagdagdag ng social protection schemes natin para sa mga kababayan natin and again this is where uh, our partnerships with with agencies like the PIDS is crucial and extremely important. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, um, ASEC uh, Paul. So friends, um, to cap our discussion, may I ask each presenter for their brief final remarks, starting uh, with uh, Dr. Tabuga and then we go uh, to each of our um, discussants. Ao, would you have any final words Thank you. you would like to say to our participants? Yes, thank you, Sheila. Um, as a, a scholar uh, on international migration, and as a as a Filipino who have um who have benefited from international migration, um, I think that we should do more for our migrant workers. Um, I know that we are already doing a lot of things. Um, and and um, saan po hindi po um mapapagod ng ating gobyerno ang ang mga uh, colleagues natin ang mga um government officials natin to take good care of them because they are in a very different situation than the workers um uh, in the domestic uh, in our uh, in our country. And so um uh, me as a researcher, I'll continue to work on this. Um, this is a, a topic that's very close. To my heart, and um, I'm. I, I also look forward to to be uh, working with our uh, government um, agencies because we have lots of work uh, coming in uh, in terms of the COVID response. So there's there are new studies, and uh, um, this is a, a a program of different studies that's coming in the future. And so um, I really uh, I really ask or request for all your cooperation, and I'm very thankful that we got I got a lot of insights um, from our discussions um, this afternoon. And thank you very much. Thank you very much to uh, Director Alberto Buga. Okay, so uh, may we hear from um, Director uh, Joe of OWA. Ma'am, you may have um, some uh, final words for our participants. The final words, um, uh, personal lang. <laughs> I'm quite ambivalent with our stage now. Uh, ito yung, yung, yung time now we're getting off the pandemic perhaps, uh, medyo lumuluwag na, and maybe we are reconsidering now more deployment. Maliit pa lang ang 600 nga, sabi na ni Dr. Tabuga, ma before it was 1 million and more. And then on the other hand, uh bang prospect for local employment. So, so you know, you know the balancing uh, balancing act really at this time. Ayun ang talagang dapat pag paghandaan. Ayun uh, uh, sa labas ng bansa, uh, uh, the the prospects for new jobs. Uh, hindi na ganong kadami. Marami na rin competition. And then the the cost of deployment now, including your social insurance, is bigger. Yun lang pong mm -hmm. health insurance. Uh, kung ilalagay natin yung compre, yung, yung injury, including force majeure, kasi mm -hmm. syempre, gusto na natin ng ganong klaseng insurance. Yes. But then again, tumataas ang deployment cost in everything. Mm -hmm. So, ayan na naman tayo. And then, um, 
Uh, on the other hand, dito, uh, yung kailangan natin on moving forward and getting out of the pandemic, uh, an, yung strategy natin to recover, sana ano, consciously makasama natin yung mga OFWs and we're here to to assist in that area, yung magkaroon sila ng panibagong, uh, panibagong pag-asa dito sa atin and and uh, sana um, makasama namin sila sa ganung bagay at makatulong and uh, yung bang baka nandun tayo din sa crossroad na uh, pipiliin na ng isang Pilipino manggagawang uh, dating OFW na mag stay na talaga dito sa Pilipinas yes, yes. alam mo yung ganun to take advantage of this pandemic uh, uh, a pandemic situation out of this a eh, Ma uh, ando na pala yung chance natin to move forward. Uh, hopefully alam mo nang pangarap namin magkaroon ng uh, net uh, flow na yung reverse migration. Yung pag mas ma marami nang bumabalik kaysa sa lumalabas. Um, maybe baka naman pwede nga yung panahon na to. Thank you very much. Thank you araw. very much din po uh, Director Jocelyn Hapal of OOA. Very well said ma'am. Ang dami tating reflections na pwede nating makuha from this uh, webinar. Uh, from uh, what uh, Director Tabuga said and what you also have shared, uh, kayo pong lahat ng uh, discussions namin. Okay, and now we go to um, ASEC uh, Paul Cortez. Sir, would you have anything, any uh, final words to say? But uh, you may, may we also ask you to uh, answer this uh, final, may humabol po na katanungan, and I think this is also very relevant. And this one is from Artemio Capellan. How do we assist or tackle legal issues on, on Asian hate or racism, not only in the U.S., but also in other countries against our overseas Filipino workers? Thank you, sir. Salamat, Dr. Sheila. The issues with regard to migration and overseas Filipinos is always a very political one. It's an issue very close to the hearts of our policymakers, but more so to the hearts of our politicians and our leaders. And this we can capitalize to make people uh, understand what it means to protect our overseas Filipinos all the more. Hindi ho uh, magagawang solusyon niya ng isang sangay lang ng society natin. It's not just the job of the government, but it is a job of every sector in society. Mapa local government unit man, and this is where mainstreaming of OFW's concern should be in the local development plan again, as mentioned by Ms. Cynthia, and uh, also to the academe, through our students, through, through our various elements of our society, so that we can come up with a solution for for our uh, a, a solution for our kababayans for our overseas Filipinos. That being said, with regard to uh, Artemio's uh, OF, sorry, Artemio's comment on uh, Asian hate. Well, at this point, the uh, Philippines is always very uh, in close touch with our embassies and consulates abroad. And if and when legal representation is needed to prosecute those who uh, who, who perpetuate Asian hate and for victims of Asian hate, then the government will be there through the legal assistance fund that the government manages. Again, because we believe that everything uh, that the government does is always for the benefits of our people and this time uh, through our to our overseas Filipinos in the US victims of Asian hate. Thank you very much Asa Cortez and finally of course last but at the least may I call on uh, um, Executive Director Ellen Sana. Ma'am would you like to try your audio for one last time? Baka, baka yes. okay na? Okay go ahead ma'am. <laughs> But I put okay. my my last thoughts also on the chat box just in case. So maybe I can just read it. That yes, uh, my I, I'm saying in the chat box that uh, as we emerge from the pandemic, I hope we will exert really really serious efforts to revive economy and generate this job opportunities for all, sustainable livelihoods for our people and for, for our repatriated migrants and for prospective migrants. 
you should stop my grieving sa mga mga. But strengthening so that's the learning from yung uh, maging choice na lang siya sana and the best option is to stay in the country. But also to strengthen our safety nets and social protection. But not only tayo unilateral as we have always been doing for the last many decades, but taking to task this time around the countries of destination the international community so uh, it has to be shared responsibility international partnership and solidarity so to look after the welfare and after the rights of our migrant workers and the members of their families so i don't know audible ako salamat po at maraming salamat din po Actually, uh, E.B. Uh, Sana is uh, currently doing her field work, and but uh, thank you very much, ma'am, for taking the time to be with us today, despite your busy schedule, uh, and despite uh, the challenges uh, uh, posed by your internet connectivity. Maraming salamat po. So, friends, please join me in thanking our paper authors led by Dr. Obi Tabuga of PIDS and our discussants. Uh, Director Jocelyn Hapal of OWA, ASIC Raymond Cortez of the DFA's Office of Migrant Workers Affairs, and Executive Director Ellen Sana of the Center for Migrant Advocacy. Let us give all of them a big virtual clap. Okay. And before we finally close, I would like to announce the winners of our poll. So let me check um, who the winners are. Okay. From WebEx. Um, Maria Victoria Evangelista and Percival D. Tome. Maria Victoria Evangelista and Percival Tome. And from Facebook, I think only one got the right answer. It's uh, Lea Lobrera. Lea Lobrera. So uh, we will contact you, uh, Ms. Evangelista, uh, Mr. Tome, and Mr. Lobrera. Our uh, webinar team will contact you for the delivery of your prize. Okay? So. And friends, before we finally close, um, I would like to announce, uh, I would like to uh, tell all of you uh, some reminders, okay? So you can access all the presentation from today's webinar from the PIDS website. And flash on the screen is uh, the link, uh, not just to uh, the seminar page, uh, but also the, the link to the, to, to the full studies of Dr. Aubrey Tabuga. So you may download these studies, uh, from, from uh, the website of PIDS. Also, please answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. And we will also email you the link after the event. Your comments are important to us to improve our virtual events. And also please uh, regularly visit our website and social media pages. Um, we have a Facebook account and uh, we would like to thank all those who uh, watched the live stream of this webinar and also participated in the open forum. Also, uh, we have a Twitter account and we have a YouTube channel where you can find all the webinar recordings before the pandemic and during the pandemic. Okay, and finally, uh, okay, we have uh, two more webinars this April. So after Holy Week, uh, on April 21, we will have a webinar on another tap, another relevant topic, this time on modern technology application and regulation in the Philippines. And on April 28, uh, we will have a webinar on um, assessing the implementation of the Responsible Parenthood and Reproductive Health Act. So all of these webinars will feature the studies of PIDS on this topic. Okay. And uh, finally, we would like to acknowledge the various organizations from the government, academe, civil society, business, and international development community who joined us today. You can uh, find uh, the names of these agencies on the screen, and we will continue to flash the slides after uh, I end the webinar. So friends, this concludes our virtual event for today. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay informed too. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day. Marani salamat po. Salamat. Salamat po. Thank you. Thank you, Asek, Paul. Salamat. Nagyaman, nagyaman kami. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs> nagyaman na kami na po. Nagyaman. <laughs>